and experienced surgeons than from textbooks. True, you know, sir. True. <laughs> every day is a challenge. You know, even today, yesterday I was doing a destroying that impaction. It was a challenge. See, it's just that. Okay. <clears throat> you, you were sir, can we get started, sir? Yeah. Sir, can we get started? Come, come. Yeah, yeah. Good sir, morning, yeah. everyone. Welcome to the uh, webinar on improving outcome in minor oral surgeries. Uh, minor oral surgeries is a uh, procedure that we do in everyday practice as a general practitioner or as a normal maxillofacial surgeon. And to start this new year, 2022, with a very all-important topic, minor oral surgery. Now I invite uh, the president of the State Association uh, Oral Maxillofacial Surgeons of India, Tamil Nadu Puducherry Branch, Dr. Krishna Kumar Raja, to welcome the participants and the panelists. Over to you, sir. Uh, good morning, uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure to have uh, the the speakers, uh, the uh, experienced and uh, you know well accomplished speakers. Uh, for today's uh, program on uh, improving outcome in my role surgery. As uh, I was discussing just before you started the program, I think this is a very, very, very important topic, uh, especially for postgraduates uh, who think that, you know, major surgery is all about uh, maxillary patient. They don't realize that minor surgery is very important. So uh, welcome you all. And uh, uh, welcome our foreign speaker from Australia, Dr. Ann Collins, uh, for taking her time off uh, to uh, share her experience. And my good friend, Dr. Saranand, Dr. Saumitran, Dr. Yoganathan, uh, Binala and Shalom for uh, taking off your valuable time, uh, sharing your experience with us. Thank you very much. And thank Jameson for this program. Thank you, sir. Thank you. And now, uh... It's my pleasure to introduce the moderator and the panelists. Uh, we have Dr. Chandran Saravanan, a very experienced uh, oral maxillofacial surgeon from Chennai, who is moderating this fantastic panel. Uh, Dr. Chandran uh, Saravanan uh, completed his BDS uh, way back in the year 1990 from University of Madras, and then he went on to get his fellowship from the Royal College of Surgeons of England, UK, in 1999. And uh, then he was working as a specialist oral maxillofacial surgeon in Saudi Arabia. Uh, uh, he was a uh, surgical registrar in Loyal College in London. Uh, and he has been an invited faculty to many uh, conferences and programs uh, in India and abroad. And he has been conducting many programs as well, and he is an accomplished uh, uh, the Evo uh, faculty, and he is uh, also a, a faculty for uh, in, in FICOI. And uh, right now, he is the professor in the Department of Oral Maxillofacial Surgery at uh, SRM Katangrut Dental College, Chennai. Welcome, Dr. Saranan, to the program. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Now, uh, it's my pleasure to invite, uh, introduce the next. Uh, Speaker, the panelist, Dr. Ann Collins uh, from Sydney, Australia. She completed her BDS in the year 1970 from the University of London, Guy's Hospital, and then she went on to complete her fellowship in the Royal College of Australian uh, Dental Surgeon, FRKDA, and also completed her F she also graduated diploma in health law faculty of uh, in the from the faculty of law Sydney University and right now she has been work, working as a consultant uh, at Westmead Hospital Sydney and she has also been a friend of the Australian and New Zealand of Oral Maxillary Surgeon, past chapters in ANZA AMS Research and Education Foundation, Trust and Director of Operations Research for PBU. Welcome, Dr. Ann Collins, to our program. Thank you. It's my pleasure to introduce the next uh, speaker, Dr. Somitran, who is the principal of Government Dental College, Calicut. Uh, he completed his BDS from Cards, Manipal, and MDS from Government Dental College, Calicut. He brings 
uh, within uh, 30 years of teaching experience and he has been a professor in head of the department in maxillofacial surgery for past 18 years. Uh, he is a former dean of dentistry in the Calicut University and he has been a regular speaker in the state and national conferences of Association of Maxillofacial Surgeons of India. And, he, and to add to that, he has got many publications and, uh, and, and also attended many international uh, conferences. So thank you, Dr. Somitran, for your participation and for accepting your invite. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, next in the panel is Dr. Shalu Bansal. Uh, is an oral maxillofacial surgeon and implantologist. She completed her BDS from SDRD Amritsar and MDS from KVG Dental College, Sulia, Karnataka. She started her journey in academics in 2008 from Surendra Dental College. And in 2012, she went to Tata Memorial Hospital, Mumbai as a trainee. And she did a EVA fellowship in 2018 from NHS Birmingham. Presently, she is working as a professor and head department of oral maxillofacial surgery in SDKS Dental College and Hospital, Nagpur. She is a life member of the Association of Moral Maxillofacial Surgeons of India, Indian Dental Association, Indian Society of Oral Implantology, and she is having a teaching experience of close to 14 years post MBS, and she is a PG guide since 2012. Her area of interest includes basic I mean, oral it's oral it's oral implant, trauma, TNG surgeries, oral pathologies, orthopedic surgery. She has been a I mean, she has got many international and national publications to her credit. She has been a guest speaker, staff person, and judge at many international, national, and state-level conferences. She has also organized various workshops and hands-on courses. Welcome, Dr. Shali, to the program. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you. And next, thank you. And next in our panel is uh, our very own yoga, Dr. Yogananda. Uh, he graduated from Sri Ramchandra Medical College uh, in 2001. And he went on to do his post-graduation in OMSS from uh, Raja Muthiah Dental College and Hospital Anna University and has been mentored by Professor Dr. Kangavilu. He has completed his uh, fellowship in implantology in 2009, advanced implantology in 12, I mean, and uh, uh, completed his MSDS, RCPS from the Royal College of Physicians. Mm -hmm. And MSDS, RCX from ah, the Royal College of Surgeons, Edin Pro. He completed his fellowship in 2019 from Royal College of uh, Physician Surgeons of Glasgow. He is an examiner for Part 2 MSDS in the Indian subcontinent, and he has published uh, many papers in all leading national and specialty journals in India and abroad. Uh, he has been a reviewer in many journals. Uh, he was the former chairman of the uh, in CDE, IDA, South Africa branch, and he presently heads the Department of Craniofacial Surgery and Dentistry at Vailamal. Medical College and Hospital Research Institute, Madurai, and he's also senior consultant, OMFS at Velamal Specialty Hospital. Welcome, Yoga, to the program. And we have uh, uh, the youngest among the lot, Dr. Abhinav, who completed his uh, BDS from Rajas Dental College and MBS from Savita Dental College. Uh, and right now he is uh, pursuing his PhD from the Deakin University, Australia. And uh, he has been a, uh, he started his professional career uh, as a teacher in uh, Savita Dental College. And right now he is an associate professor in the Department of Implantology, Savita Dental College and Hospital. And he has got high impact factor publications and he has been invited faculty uh, to a few conferences and he has done many oral presentations in his career so far. And he has undergone training in zygomatic implant uh, workshop at the Rajan Dental Hospital, training on basic life support, sinus lip procedures, and he has also uh, trained in statistics. And he has been the member of the prestigious Association of Oral Maxillofacial Surgeons of India and the ICOI uh, and also ITI. Welcome, Dr. Abhinav. Thank you, sir. To the Thank you, sir. Yes, uh, with a brief uh, introduction, uh, I hand over the stage to Dr. Saravanan for the <laughs> fantastic piece that is going to follow. Over to you, Dr. Saravanan. Uh, thank you, Mr. Secretary, and thank you, Mr. President, for the welcome address. Uh, we have. And, uh, sorry, and I, I have the uh, uh, information for the participants. You can post your question in QA uh, menu, which is right down there in the uh, screen. 
Q and A. Any questions are welcome. We'll take it as and when we have a take a break. Thank you. Thanks again, Mr. Secretary. Uh, good morning, one and all present in this uh, lovely webinar of 2022. In fact, actually, one of the uh, in the groups, uh, Dr. Arun has mentioned this is Wave Three, Session One. Is how uh, he has described this uh, group of webinars. Now we start with minor oral surgery. Now, though it's called minor oral surgery, it's probably the most important thing in a in a in a session in a, in the hands of a maxillofacial surgeon because this is bread and butter. And if this is not handled well, honestly speaking, we are not going to be really happy with our progress in whichever field we are actually choosing in. We have a galaxy of speakers. They have all been introduced. I don't want to stand in the way. We do have a structure in this program. As Dr. Jimson has said, please put your queries on Q&A. We will try to be as inclusive as possible. To start with, in fact, we have Professor Somitran, sir, who is going to lay down the principles of any oral surgery for that matter, very importantly for minor oral surgery, including instrumentation. Then we are going to take up, we are not covering everything. It is not possible to do all that in a two hour session. Second, we have Dr. Shalu, who is coming with the galaxy of information, which is scientifically backed, all like evidence-based uh, topics, what she's going to talk about in impactions. It's going to be a great eye-opener for both the practitioners, as well as the people who are in a training, who are going to take the examination. Then we follow it up with something much more contemporary, which we talk about socket preservation, functional rehabilitation. In IE, we are talking about immediate placing of implants, <coughs> rafting, all those backed by science. We are giving you sort of nice, beautiful ones. And then we have Dr. Yogananda, who is going to tell you, tread with caution. He's going to give you an overview of what we should not oversee. We should always be prepared. That's what Dr. Yoga is going to come up with. We have Dr. Ann Collins all the way from Australia, who is going to give an international input for every of the points what we are going to discuss. Is there any other way of looking at it? Right. And then we are going to have a galaxy, like we have a group of uh, cases, which we will discuss it. Almost every expert who's present in here will give their opinions. We do expect every participant to give your own input so that we will try to keep it as inclusive as possible. Without taking much delay, let's proceed. And I'm going to invite Professor Saumitran, sir, to start the proceedings. Saumitran, sir, over to you. Yeah. Yeah. Can you share the screen? Yeah. I mean, the presentation. A very good morning to all. Yeah, very good morning. Uh, welcome uh, very much. Thank you so much, uh, Tamil Nadu Association, for calling me for this program. Uh, Rio Raja, Saravanan, and uh, Collins, Shalu, Abhinav, and uh, Jimson, and uh, also Yoga, who is going to join us, I think. And we'll have a wonderful session. I'm straight away starting with the principles of minor oral surgery. Next one. So this is one of the most important topic uh, uh, as everyone is concerned because the, the improving minor oral surgical procedures is a need of the hour all the time. And for that matter, any surgery, the fundamentals are you should always be extensive knowledge about the subject. One should also always keep updating and uh, see the recent thing coming, coming up, the evolution, the material we are using, the techniques we are using, and all the things. And constantly develop your surgical skills. That's also very important. So, and that will give you a very efficient, uh, can you go back? That will give you a very efficient and uh, effective care and also helps you to develop new procedures and techniques. Next one. So to put it in a flow chart, you know, you have to develop a surgical diagnosis, the most important thing. And what are the basic necessities for surgery, aseptic technique, incisions and flaps, Every single uh, procedure has got its principles. Impaction has got its own principle. Sister nucleation has got its own principle. Implant surgery has got its own principle. So one should understand what are the basic fundamental principles. It's going back to the basics. Next one. So a, a thorough history, starting from there in that order, a very thorough clinical examination, then the required radiology or whatever other specialized investigations, the lab investigations and the biopsy. Then you come to the final diagnosis. Next one. 
So uh, it, it takes uh, adequate visibility and accessibility, the most fundamental thing, you know, without these things, it will be very difficult to do an excellent surgery. You may be uh, very well versed in the subject, but if you compromise on these things, uh, your procedure is going to be a, a disaster. So that's a very important vital area, getting a visibility and accessibility. And as an oral surgeon, the oral cavity, you have all the problems of the visibility and, and accessibility issues. You have the tongue and saliva flowing and especially when the patient is conscious, it's going to be a real, a real problem for a, one person to do, and especially the third molar area and inaccessible areas. So it's going to be a real art and uh, your, your dexterity and your skill and judgment, which gives you a very good result. Next. Next one, next slide. Yeah, you have a very variety of uh, retractors which has to be used for each purposes. And to be very gentle with the tissue, use the appropriate retractors, a good mouth prop and a very good mouth opening is very essential. And see that you use a cheek retractor, which is a very versatile kind of a retractor. There are many, a lot of device retractors available. Use accordingly to the procedure and so that the, the procedure becomes a very trouble-free one. Next one. Next slide. Uh, and this, go back, yeah. So these kinds of iatrogenic things, you have to be always careful. You'll be concentrating on the impaction, bone cutting. You're not knowing that your micromotor is getting uh, heated up and you're boiling or you're giving a, a burn on the lips like that or a pulling on the, on the lips or something like that, give a bruise like that. The surgery will be very good. You might have done the impaction well, but the patient will have such a big trouble in the post -op period. Next. Next one, next slide. Yeah, adequate light, I already mentioned, we have many devices recently. We have loops available, we have headlights available, we have uh, retractors and things connected with lights, fiber optic lights, uh, which we do in most of the orthognathic and all channel, channel retractor and uh, Austin, everything has got a light on it connected. So the site is so beautifully illuminated so that you can perform your procedures very well. Next. And of course, uh, it goes without saying that you need a very good anxiety patient should be completely assured of the procedure, especially if it is a conscious patient and we are doing an LA. And you should cooperate and uh, give the confidence in the surgeon to, uh, to, uh, to uh, cooperate with you during the surgery. So I leave you to anxiety and give it an excellent pain management. So your anesthesia should be very good. And sedation, of course, whatever method you are using, and sometimes many prefer general anesthesia, and even for extraction, people prefer to have general anesthesia. So in the general anesthesia management, what are the things you should be keeping in mind? Uh, don't put any foreign body into the, into the patient's lungs, uh, pack it properly, and don't put any instruments or pack inside. All these things are very vital uh, things uh, a surgeon has to keep it in mind. Next one. Aseptic technique, uh, with, uh, without mention, it's the most important aspect. Never introduce an infection into a surgical site. And also see the external environment. You can send the patient for oral prophylaxis and uh, mouthwash before surgery. These things take a long way in preventing things like a dry socket uh, or some sort of a post-operative osteomyelitis, all sorts of things. Cellulitis, third molar patient coming with a mandibular space infection, okay, an acute pericoronitis being operated. Okay, and those cases are flaring up with the osteomyelitis. So a very great concern should be done on that. And the instrument should be very properly arranged, like the way I have uh, put here. That should be kept in nicely organized way. And you have to really do a homework on that and work like that. Next one. So, of course, the surgical, if you don't know the surgical anatomy, then you cannot never be a good surgeon. So, very thorough about the anatomical things. Intraorally, you have, you are typically, you, are, you are, should be careful about the lingual nerve, which is running close to the, on the lingual side. You have the greater palatine and nasopalatine nerves in the palate. You have the ducts, the submandibular ducts and the other parotid papillae uh, in the upper area. You have the nasopalatine, the median palatine things and the lingual artery on the lingual aspect, and the facial artery on the buccal side the muscle attachments, next one. So everything has to be taken care. Next slide. Next slide. Yeah, the incisions, everyone know the basic principles. I'm just running through that. You have to, uh, the, the flaps should be wider and there should be adequate uh, blood supply to the, the flaps and the designing should be perfect. Make sure that uh, the access uh, has to be met, kept in mind when you're designing a flap and they don't later on struggle for access with the surgical site. Next one. 
Of course, you know that our good old, uh, our BB blade and pottery and lasers, it depends on the expert's choice of what the equipment they are using. Everyone has got its own advantage and disadvantage. But basically, uh, uh, I do follow with the, with, the, with the BB blade because of the, uh, the tactile thing and things like that. Of course, lasers play a big role in implant surgery, which uh, Dr. Abhinav is going to cover. And cautery, of course, uh, has its own disadvantage, but of course, provides a hemostasis to the field. Next one. Next slide. Again, same thing. I was telling you about the, the distal limb of the, uh, the, the third molar incision. You traumatize a temporalis muscle patient, you'll have post Christmas. The other one was an implant incision where a laser is used, which gives a most aesthetic uh, uh, incision on the, on the margins of a central incisor in the aesthetic zone, which I think definitely uh, Abhinand will be talking to you. Abhinand will be talking to you. So those are things. I'm just putting some of the important things. Uh, we could not cover everything here anyway. Next. A flap design. Again, the basic things are wider flap. You know, the base should be wider. It should be supported by sound board. Always, always keep these things in your mind. We do many more surgical, complex surgeries also by intraoral approach, but the fundamentals are the same and has to be followed. Next. Next one, uh, different designs of flap as you need. You can design whatever way, uh, comparing with the, you want more access for a palatal flap where you think about the vascularity of the flap, which is important. Next one. So uh, to put it all together, it is a respect the tissues. You always get an adequate access and light, operate in a very clean field and use a very controlled force. Sometimes you see that people uh, wriggle and uh, wrestle with the tissues and pull it out like that. Those things are the one which is going to be positive pretty demand. <clears throat> Many such issues. Next one. Next slide. Next slide. This again, flap dehiscence as a, as a result of all these things is what we get. Necrosis and tearing. Next one. Next slide. Technique of bone removal, chisel and again, you have various methods, chisel and mallet and bird technique and we have come to lasers and piezoelectric systems recently. Next one. Those areas we can touch upon while discussing the cases. We'll tell you the pros and cons of each one. Piso is very good in implant surgeries as it does not destroy the bone and maintain even the osteocytes uh, very viable. Next one. Again, in extractions, you have periotomes now. You don't uh, remove much bone during extraction. Like our olden time, you don't squeeze the socket and reduce the width of the socket. You know, you're going to place an implant. So according to the, the, the changes, you know, in the present day scenario, the bone has to be always uh, you know, maintained. Next. And we used to say the bone is for the patient and the tooth is for the surgeon. We read that in the textbooks. Uh, but nowadays, the tooth is also for the patient. We try to retain the tooth root stems also, we do post and core, and we do retain sometimes all those things. So and everything is for the patient. You don't uh, take away the unwanted tissues. You know, you try to preserve and try to do things. Hemostasis, of course, is a fundamental thing in any surgery. You have to control the bleeding. You should not uh, make a hematoma, uh, which creates a post-operative infection. And you have trouble in the intra-op and post-op periods. Various agents are used for that, and which we'll discuss in the discussion part. Next one, a dead space management. Again, preventing hematoma formation, keeping it drain, or uh, keeping a pressure pack. All are done as usual in all surgeries. Next, external environment. Debridement is very important. Removing all foreign bodies. Granulation tissue has to be removed out. Bony pieces, filling materials. See that the socket is clean, the bony margins are filed nicely. Next. Again, decontamination and use always cold saline is a very good agent which can use cold saline with nicely, uh, give a soothing effect to the tissues. Next. Edema control, again, a careful general handling. Pre-op steroids can be in many of the difficult cases which we give. It has got its own some side effects which we'll discuss. Ice packs. Positioning of the patient in the post-op period for dra helping in draining and preventing in bleeding, controlling bleeding. Next one. Of course, in the end, the patient general condition and the nutrition is the most important one. That's the one healing the patient's wound. So a surgeon has to see that uh, the proper patient is properly prepared before surgery so that you know he doesn't have to develop any other systemic issues and uh, other healing issues, which is going to uh, give a bad result for your surgery. Next one. Post-op care, edema control, infection control, and nutrition of the patient. Then the suture removal and follow-up is also very important. Next. 
next one. That's our team. And now to put it in a nutshell, the take home message for all the youngsters and surgeons. Uh, with my experience of many years, I would be telling you, your diagnostic ability has to be really good. You see that you are doing the case of uh, surgery for the right case and the, and the right type of surgery, or you don't need surgery. You think of some other measures, all has to be kept in mind. Develop your technical skills. Many of the things are technical oriented things nowadays. You have to be uh, 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 acclimatized with the lasers or the piezoelectric system or endoscopic surgery or robotic surgery. You need training and things like that for that and good judgment, compassion to your patient and constant updating on the subject. And the most important, even if you're a general practitioner or a professional man or an academician, quality research, you can always associate with your work. Publish your work. Keep on updating with the CME programs like this and improve your work and provide an excellent name for the max fact surgery and a, a great benefit to your patient and care. Thank you very much. Uh, I was rushing through the presentation where I had to cover up within 10 minutes. Thank you very much for the patient listening. Thanks a lot, uh, Swamitran, sir. That was, <clears throat> I guess, for every budding surgeon, young surgeon, and experienced surgeon, I guess there is no taking that away from the principles of any surgery right from choosing the appropriate instrumentation to the aseptic technique and the post-operative and the intraoperative respect to the tissues and post-operative handling of the patient. It needs to be a package. That makes any surgery a pleasure for the patient as well as the operator. Yes, that's the first important thing. Now I invite uh, Dr. Shalu Bansal to present on impactions. She's going to show you with a lot of evidence base. Over to Dr. Shalaban, sir. Thank you so much, sir. And thank you, everyone, especially Dr. Simpson, sir. And very good morning to all of you. As everyone and each one of us is aware that impactions are most routinely done procedure in our clinical practice. So next slide, please. When we're talking about patient safety first approach concept, it's not new. And it includes a perioperative management of the patient. So in coming few slides, we are going to deal with so that we can learn to improve the clinical outcome pertaining to especially this procedure. So next slide, please. Uh, and obviously the journey starts from the pre-diagnostic uh, workup. As Sumitran sir just said, ki you should have a diagnostic ability so that you can discuss easily with the patient what exactly is going to happen and what should they should expect, what sort of a comorbidity, com comorbidity they are going to ex expect in this whole procedure. Kindly, sir, go to the next slide. So you need to justify why you are extracting any particular tooth. This is a beautiful article given in uh, Clinics of North America on impacted teeth in 2007, where they have given us a, uh, two schools of thought regarding the prophylactic removal of the impacted lower third molar. And at the end of the day, they summarize the absolute indications for the impacted third molar, which includes a pericornitis, uh, caries uh, to the second molar, root caries to the second molar before the denture construction and before we are proceeding for any orthognathic surgical procedures. So next slide. So this pre-diagnostic workup also includes a detailed history of the patient and the clinical and the radiological examination. So next slide. And in this radiological examination, Rude et al. has given uh, criteria for, for the prediction of the inferior alveolar nerve injury during the third molar surgery. And this article is published uh, in BJOM 1990. They have given the seven classification out of which darkening of the root and interruption of the white line is having the higher chances of the inferior alveolar nerve injury. So next slide. With the advent of the CBCT, we can easily appreciate where exactly and what sort of a relation the apex of the tooth is having with the mandibular canal. And we should take advantage of uh, that thing, especially when we are discussing about the roots criteria. But again, considering the limited availability or the cost factor or the radiation hazards, many of uh, would like to hesitate to go for this. But I request everybody if you're having that provision and if you can have or uh, the CBCT kindly consider. The reason behind, you can have that discussion and you can modify a bit of your treatment plan. So next slide, please. In the same article, the author has divided the relationship of the apex of the tooth with the mandibular canal and he has divided this in the seven uh, various classification. You can go through this article. Next slide, sir. 
uh, this is an article uh, which is showing the CBCT relation of the sinus membrane with the effects of the upper third molar. And they have given a beautiful classification in horizontal and vertical relations. In vertical relations, they have further divided this relation into five categories. Why this category is important? Because they have told in this that type 3 is having higher chances of oroantral communication and we should be mentally ready and the consent should be there. And when we're talking about horizontal relationship, it is a type one where sinus lining is actually protruding more towards the buccal side is having the higher chances of oral communication. The next slide, please. Uh, this article is actually published in Journal of Orthodontic Science because when we're talking about impacted canine, you need to consider the age of the patient. You need to see the dental and the chronological age. You need to see the contralateral side. And if the patient, that tooth can be erupted uh, with the help of orthodontic treatment, you must consider ortho opinion. And if the patient is ready to go through that journey of the uh, few years, then definitely yes. In this uh, article, why I have taken this article? Because in this, they have told about uh, that they have given a beautiful indices, which I'm going to show in the next slide, that if the number is more than nine, then it is unlikely that the tooth is going to erupt and we can consider the surgical extraction of that particular tooth. So next slide, please. Okay. In that, they have summarized that if the tooth is uh, horizontally placed, palatally placed near to the nasal cavity in the maxillary sinus, it is unlikely going to erupt. So next slide. Thank you. We cannot uh, forget the importance of the war lines and the difficulty index. Literature is full of various difficulty indices, but I think uh, most of us are prefer to go for a uh, modern uh, modified Pedersen index. Uh, with the help of these indices and uh, the considering the patient anxiety, we can consider whether we want to take up that case under LA sedation or GA. Definitely written consent is mandatory. This is a time when we must consider video consenting. Next slide, sir. Uh, next slide, sir. Regarding the intraoperative management, uh, we cannot forget the local anesthesia because it is a backbone for any surgical procedure in dentistry. Researchers are always trying to find a new way to increase the efficiency of the local anesthetic agent or various delivery system or the armamentarium which is required uh, to give local anesthesia, which includes your vibra jets, your jet syringes, bond system, and safety syringes. Next slide, sir. Uh, various uh, incisions has been tried in literature to considering the comorbidity of the patient post-operatively, also the periodontal health pertaining to the second molar. And it has been shown as per this meta-analysis that uh, enveloped incision is having uh, uh, less pain post-operatively and the reduced mouth opening is having uh, less as compared to when we're talking about the triangular incisions. As such, facial swelling is not having any statistical significant difference. Next slide, sir. We have gone through an era where uh, I think uh, our initial pioneer of the surgeons might have used the chisel and mallet. Luckily, I have used uh, straight hand piece and the burr. But uh, the era has changed. And since decade, we are into the piezo and the lasers. Uh, this meta-analysis is showing uh -huh. that the piezo uh, uh, electrical bone surgery is a bit costly. It is time consuming, although it can prevent uh, the chances of the inferior alveolar nerve injury. And if we will consider post-operatively, there is uh, statistically no significant difference when we're talking in terms of pain, tristness, or the facial swelling. The next slide. Even the same rule applies for the lasers when we are talking this thing. In this, the author has used the ER Yang laser uh, for the bone cutting for the impacted mandibular third moment. The next slide. A uh, various irrigation system has been tried by researchers. The main goal is to reduce the post-operative sequelae or increase the patient comfort zone. And that I think ozone is the newest modern technique. It is having some antibacterial property. It is having uh, some anti-inflammatory things. Uh, so this article is saying uh, that ozone water, when we are using, it is reducing the post-operative pain facial swelling and even Christmas when they have compared it with the normal saline irrigation and the poverty iodine irrigation. Next slide. Now, when we're talking about the inferior alveolar nerve injury, uh, this coronary 
Lakshmi has come into the picture, and since decade, it is a topic of debate whether to remove a full tooth or a coronectomy. Uh, we need to consider coronectomy, and uh, there, but there are certain contraindications to the coronectomy, which includes that if the teeth is having any active infection, when the teeth are mobile, or when the tooth is horizontally placed. Because if the tooth is horizontally placed, there might be a chance that it is close to the mandibular canal and we may injure the inferior alveolar canal. So whenever we are choosing all these things, we have to see the pros and cons pertaining to the surgery. So the next slide. Various uh, intrasocket medicaments has been tried to reduce the post-operative uh, sequelae as well as the chances of the dry socket, which includes a 0.2% chlorhexidine gel with or without 1% hyaluronic acid or with the metronidazole has been tried. As per this article, when they have tried this chlorhexidine gel, uh, it is slightly less better than 1% hyaluronic acid when we are talking about in terms of the dry socket. Next slide. Even the ozone gel has been tried and it is showing the wonderful results when they have compared it with the other gels when they have tried or for the intra socket medicaments. So next slide. Socket preservation, I think Dr. Abhinav is going to talk upon wonderfully. He has prepared wonderful session for you guys. So I'm not going to cover this part. When we're talking about suturing, it is always a surgeon's preference whether they want to consider resorbable or non-resorbable sutures. Sinocrylate is not new one, but as per this article, the use of the sinocrylate is limited, especially for the extensive flaps. Uh, when we're talking about the post-operative management, uh, so next slide, various therapeutic agents has been tried in literature. The main goal is to increase the comfort zone of the patient. So next slide. As per Cochrane Library, when we are talking about antibiotics in infection, they have told when the tooth is asymptomatic and it is a normal healthy patient, antibiotics are having a limited role. Still, the literature is full of various combinations which has been tried in literature, which includes a penicillin with or without metronidazole combination. They have provided via the systemic route or the local drug delivery. When the tooth is symptomatic, they have even considered the various combination of the oral route or the IV route. Uh, researchers has even tried a uh, single dose of the two gram uh, pre-op dose versus post-operative antibiotic doses, or they have given the various combination pre-op, which includes a pre-op plus post-operative antibiotic with varying degree of success. So next slide. But as per this meta-analysis, they have told that if we are talking about antibiotics, it will reduce the chances of infection seven by 70% and chances of the dry software by approximately 35%. So next slide. Analgesia play a very big role. Various combination of NSAIDs and opioids with or uh, has been tried in literature. They can be used all together. Uh, even the primitive analgesia has been tried and it is proven that if we are doing this thing, it is going to reduce the post-op pain as well as the number of the rescue analgesics uh, the patient is taking. So next slide. Transdermal patches has also been tried, especially for the patient who is complaining for the gastric irritation, and they are found to be equally effective uh, when we are talking about oral route of the analgesia. So next slide. This is a clinical trial when I was going through this journey, and they have uh, their alternate hypothesis hypothesis is that gabapentine is going to reduce the post-operative pain and the number of the rescue painkillers uh, in third molar dental extraction. This clinical trial is still running. It is a USA based. In this, uh, in one group, in the study group, they are giving three of uh, gabapentine 600 mg and in control group, they are just giving a placebo. So next slide. We're waiting for the results, what exactly they are supposed to say. Uh, we cannot deny the role of the steroids in reducing the facial swelling in impaction, it might be given by a systemic route or by oral route. Next slide. A various um, things has been tried as per I'm saying it again and again, just to increase the comfort of the patient post-operatively pertaining to this procedure. 
even the ozone therapy has been tried in this uh, article they have applied the ozone probe extra orally near to the masseter muscle and it is found to be effective in reducing the pain swelling and tristness but the difference is found to be statistically non significant so next slide laser has also been tried in this uh, the author has used as g lasers both intra orally and extra orally on immediately post operatively and after 24 hours and he claims that uh, uh, it is going to reduce the post operative swelling and tenderness so next slide cryotherapy as such is having a very limited role when we are talking in terms of the pain swelling and tenderness so next slide Uh, PRF, I think it's not new. It has been used for the socket preservation since decade, but uh, recently many articles are coming into picture where they are showing that uh, it is good for the soft tissue healing also. And this article claims that uh, uh, a PRF is better in uh, reducing the post-op pain and the number of rescue analgesics taken by the patient. So next slide. Uh, apart from the anterior alveolar nerve injury, uh, due to its position, lingual nerve injury is also need to be mentioned. And it is not only while uh, reflecting the flap or doing the bone cutting. Sometimes when we are uh, doing the suturing, there is a high chances that uh, lingual nerve can be injured. So next slide. As for this clinics of North America article published in. 2011 uh, if the patient is not able to feel any sort of a sensation for 8 weeks we need to refer that case to the micro neurosurgeon so next please as a surgeon we cannot uh, deny the role of the biopsy in any surgical procedure and as per literature if the follic tooth follicle size is uh, 2.5 mm or more than that we should send it for histopathological examination because they have observed in literature the chances of uh, uh, changes uh, pertaining to dentrisa cyst is as high as approximately 15.9% thank you sir um, i hope i tried to cover everything ma'am that was quite comprehensive in fact actually uh, when it comes to discussion i think we will involve all the panelists now there has been a paradigm shift like minor oral surgery impactions of the bread and butter for any maxillofacial surgeon but minor oral surgery is performed by a lot of general dentists i think it's very important when we are justified in doing cbct but the words will change from we doing justified by doing cbct or we will be required to do cbct there are times i guess if we do not have a cbct before we touch a particular area we might probably be called as like we have not taken adequate precautions i guess that's the way forward i guess we have to move with times and she has come with some wonderful literature support even to like basically classification we are talking about the old classification about the angulation yes they are still very relevant but when it comes to its close relationship to the nerve now cbct has cbct blaze classification will have a significant role in reducing the morbidity paraffin and it does not stop just with the mandibular wisdom teeth we can i now when do we choose we are going to do an orthodontic way or whether we are going to do it a surgical way or are we just going to leave it alone and then wait and watch i guess all options are any day open to any clinician however any decision what we make needs to be based on evidence and evidence need to be supposed by supported by very good literature thanks a lot dr shaluji like that was fantastic you had actually thrown open a huge amount of a scientific evidence into this presentation uh, thank you and i'm sure that this is going to be helping both the trainees as well as the practitioners alike i hope so thank you thank you sir thank you so much the next in line believe me this is contemporary now obviously minor oral surgery has got so many wings but we are just sticking to a few wings and the next one is a young uh, surgeon dr abinav who is i guess its more main interest is on implantology but now when you do an extraction the earlier noble blava professor brenamax principle wise you go in through a healed socket now principles are changing how we are looking at it more and do we go in for immediate i mean if 
who want to go for immediate, is there any criteria? When do you do a socket preservation? He is going to throw a lot of light on it, again, supported by a lot of evidence. Over to Dr. Abhinav. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much for the lead on. Right, so, you know, whenever we do, we do an extraction, particularly the anteriors, you know, there's always a dilemma for all of us surgeons, you know, whether we go in for socket preservation, whether we leave the socket just as it is for it to heal and go for an implant placement later, or immediately go in for an implant placement. There's a set of guidelines which I believe are very important, you know, as a surgeon for us to just uh, see, check whether those satisfy the criteria. And if they do, then we can proceed with an immediate implant placement, or if not, we go in for a socket preservation. So I'll just be throwing light on some of these you know, factors that uh, uh, we need to look at. And then uh, in the following case discussion that we see, uh, you'll be able to understand how to uh, go in for a case process. So, uh, sir, next slide, next slide, please. So we all know that there's some form of atrophy happening to the ridge when we do the extractions. So uh, your tooth is uh, surrounded by bundle bone. Now, this bone is the bone which usually resorbs when you extract the tooth. And the amount of the alteration after this resorption is dependent on the thickness of the alveolar bone you want. In most of the extraction sites, the, the buccal wall is more thinner than the palatal or the lingual wall. And so these dimensional changes are more pronounced on the buccal aspect. So next slide. So uh, a well-cited systematic review has noted that there is an increase in clinical loss, uh, uh, clinical bone loss in the width uh, when compared to the height. So they've noted that there is a mean reduction in the width of alveolar ridges to the tune of 3.87 millimeters and a mean reduction in the mid buccal height of 1.67 millimeters. For instance, if you are uh, for an anterior tooth, if you uh, if if the mesodistal uh, sorry if the buccopalatal width of the tooth is say 7 mm and you lose about 3.87 mm, then that leaves you with hardly 3.5 to 3 mm of bone. So. Uh, uh, so that 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 uh, gets a uh, gets you to a compromised bone, and then that would require more procedures such as augmentation and all of that. So uh, it is very important to know these values. So uh, to make sure that th there are some factors that you can do to reduce your uh, uh, the amount of uh, uh, ridge resorption. So atraumatic extraction is a very important part, which I feel that all of us as surgeons should be well-versed and uh, well-qualified to do. So they have four basic principles. One, severance of the connective tissue fibers. The tooth is held together into the bone with the, uh, by these connective tissue fibers. So it is very imperative that we sever the, uh, the connection to these fibers, minimize soft tissue reflection as uh, reflection of the soft tissue leads to detachment of the periosteum from the bone. Uh, leading to, uh, to, to reduction in the blood supply to the cortical bone. 80% of the blood supply to the cortical bone is through the periosteum and the rest is only endosteal. So this would uh, uh, reduce your uh, healing uh, of the site. Reduce the contact areas when you're doing your extraction for an atraumatic extraction, because when you want to engage your uh, instruments in between the teeth, there are chances that you will damage the adjacent teeth. So it is always advisable to reduce the contact areas and very important that you section multi-rooted teeth. Never attempt to get them out whole in atraumatic extractions because it will definitely damage the adjacent tooth as well as the bone. So we will have to try and maintain the alveolar contours and the soft tissue as, uh, as they are present even after the extraction. So that is what atraumatic extraction really is. And if we are able to achieve that, then it is more easier for us to decide on uh, what we're going to do. Sir, uh, next slide, please. So to help us with these atraumatic extractions, we've got a plethora of options. Uh, the periotome is the more frequently used instrument. All of these basically make use of the biomechanical creep uh, function. Creep is nothing but the deformation happening over time uh, when a pressure is applied on anything. So uh, in, in this scenario, the creep is being applied to your periodontal ligament fibers and to the bone. So in your periotome, uh, your periotome is a very thin blade uh, with uh, 
which is sharp in the end, and you use that to sever the periodontal ligament fibers. And always remember never to apply your periotomes on the facial aspect because they will definitely remove your, uh, they will definitely lead to loss of bone on the buccal aspect. Uh, so uh, the physics forceps is also one such instrument. Now it's got a, it acts on the lever fulcrum principle. Uh, the image that you see on the buccal aspect, there's an acrylic bumper and on the palatal beak, there is a uh, beak which goes and holds the tooth below your CEJ uh, on the cementum. Now you do not apply any uh, force onto it. It's just, uh, sorry, any pressure onto it. You just give a slight force and give a traction to the forceps about 15 to 20 degree facial traction. Now what that does is you give the traction and you hold it for 30 seconds. What does that does is it increases the creep. So because of the creep, your periodontal ligament loses its uh, tension. It, uh, the, the bone starts to expand and the tooth comes out. All of these extractions take time because you need to give time for the creep to set in uh, for the bone to expand and for the teeth to come out. And we've got this newer uh, kit. We've got uh, the Benex extraction kit. So th these are basically drills which you place into your teeth and you use a, a pulling a wrench uh, like uh, instrument to engage the, uh, the screw and pull it out slowly. Again, this takes two to three minutes. So it keeps giving a constant pressure on top of the teeth to, to pull it out of the socket and uh, proceed with an, uh, and and it makes sure that the soft tissue and the bone are untouched. Next slide, sir. So we've done it. So we've done an atraumatic extraction. We know that we've, uh, we've done it to the best. We preserve the soft tissues. We've got uh, the buccal bone that we need. So how, now what do we do? Do we go in for a socket graft or, we do, or do we go in for an immediate implant placement? The next slide, sir. So these five factors, I feel are very important in this decision. Intact so socket walls, buccal bone thickness, presence of an infection, anatomic limitations, and aesthetic risk assessment. Next, sir. So, in uh, so you have basically five, uh, five walls to your socket. You have the buccal wall, the mesial, distal, palatal, and the apical end. So if you have all of these five walls intact, then the site is uh, it, it takes one of the very most important factors for placing an immediate. It takes your uh, box and you can go in with an immediate placement. But again, a five wall socket uh, has one more caveat where the buccal bone has to be more than 1.1 to 1.5 mm. If you, if, even if your uh, all five walls are intact and if you feel that the buccal thickness is very less, then you go in for a socket preservation. So basically you will have three uh, treatment options. You will you can go on for an immediate placement or you can not do a socket graft and leave it to heal on its own. Go for a delayed implant placement and go for a socket graft. Uh, I will tell you why, in, in what cases we will not do a socket graft later on. Reflection is always conservative in, in such cases. Uh, An allograft is always preferred in uh, if, if you are going to go for a socket graft. Again, I will explain the, uh, the reason why uh, for it in our later slides. It is always difficult to close an extraction socket. Please keep in mind, there are the, the tissue that you have is not sufficient. You will either have to use materials like your collagen plug or your PTFE or uh, a C, uh, a CGF or your uh, free gingival graft to close it as such or you give two relieving incisions and advance flap and close, but that would inevitably lead to disrupting your peri periodontium. Next slide, sir. And then you have your four wall defects. So where any one of the wall is damaged, invariably it will be your buccal wall because if they are very thin or if the uh, tooth is placed too buccally, you will definitely have a fenestration or a form of dehiscence happening on your wall. If that is the scenario, then you can only go in for a socket graft. An implant placement is, uh, the uh, the site is a poor to fair candidate for an implant placement. Uh, and primary closure is usually unachievable without wider elevation. Uh, so next slide, please. So to break it down for you, as simple as that, if you've got a good five volt socket, 
with all the five walls intact and you've got a buckle wall thickness of 1, 5, uh, 1 to 1 1.5 mm, you can directly go in for an immediate implant. If, if you've got a uh, five wall socket, but the buckle wall thickness is less than one to, is less than one, then you go in for a socket graft. If it is infected, you, uh, sorry, uh, if it is uh, more than 1.5 and you want to go in for a delayed placement, then you don't do a socket graft and uh, your infected site, you do not do anything. You just cure the socket and leave it as such to heal. If it's a five volt socket with less than 1.5 mm of buckle plate, then you go in for an allograft and a collagen plug. If it's four volt, again, an allograft with an extended uh, collagen membrane or a PTFE membrane. And if you've got only uh, one, two or three volts of the socket, it is better that you definitely go in for grafting uh, if it's a one wall or two wall, a block graft would be the most preferable, preferable form of uh, restoration. Uh, so the next slide, please. So next would be your buckle bone thickness. On an average, studies have showed that the buckle wall is less than one mm thick. Uh, the average value is about 0.6 to 0.7 mm. For, uh, for a good aesthetic and functional uh, um, a restoration or uh, your long-term prognosis of your implant, a buckle bone thickness of about 1 to 1.5 is uh, required. Um, also, if you see on the x-ray on the left side, uh, with the X mark, you see that the buckle bone is very thin. Extraction of, these, of this tooth would most probably lead to uh, a fracture of your uh, buckle plate. Whereas if you see on the other, uh, uh, on, in the middle picture, you can see that the buckle plate is thin and it is conducive for an immediate implant placement. Next, sir. Again, anatomical limitations is very important. You have landmarks such as your maxillary sinus, your nasal floor, your uh, inferior uh, alveolar foramen, nasopalatine foramen, and your mental foramen. So what is important is that in after your extraction socket, beyond your apex, you need at least a minimum of 4 to 5 mm of bone available. So that bone is where your implant is going to engage so that you get your primary stability. So if you are not able to achieve that, say you have only one or two mm of bone left, uh, typical to your, uh, to your root end, then it is advisable to go in for a socket preservation. If there is four to five mm, then you can uh, think about doing a uh, immediate implant. Because if there is two mm and for your primary stability, you drill a little bit deeper, you're going to end up in perforating the sinus floor or you're going to end up in injuring your inferior alveolar nerve canal. Uh, next slide, sir. Infections. Again, most of the times infections will uh, have some form of buccal dehiscence or fenestration. If you are able to completely cure at the site and degranulate the entire site using degranulation bursts, then you can attempt for a socket grafting and you can re-enter uh, after some time. If you feel that the infection is too much and you're not very sure whether you uh, completely remove the infection and the granulation tissue, you can just simply close up and, uh, uh, and re-enter uh, and graft and again uh, proceed with the implant placement. Uh, next slide, sir. And this is... One of the most important uh, factors, the aesthetic risk assessment. So immediate implant placement is always associated with the risk of mucosal recession. So if you've got a thin biotype, then there is an increased chance of recession. Again, thin facial bone, bone resorption is always on the, on the cards. Any dehiscence is present, uh, malposition. So all of these are risk indicators. So you will have to assess on the CBCT as well as after your extraction, you will have to assess whether you've got additional, uh, whether you've got the uh, required amount of bone, whether uh, all of your five sockets are intact, whether you've got sufficient uh, space in the apical region to engage your implant, whether your final restoration will be in a very uh, um, uh, acceptable position. So all of these you do it uh, in a aesthetic risk assessment. So there is a tool which is available on the ITI website, which would help you out with this. Uh, and based on this, you can uh, uh, do your uh, planning also. Uh, next slide, sir. And there's something called as a jumping distance. Now, initially, when immediate implants were started, the concept was with the whole uh, that you place your implant for the entire width of the socket. 
So what they, this did was it was including the buckle bone and all of the vaults and stability was obtained. But later on, as you saw, there was a lot of aesthetic failures happening. Uh, so uh, then came the concept of the jumping distance where it was proposed to have a 2 mm distance, a minimum of 2 mm distance between the buccal bone and the implant. So this showed that there was a, uh, there was a very good aesthetic and functional uh, outcome in the long term. And this space is always grafted by using a slow resorbing material. Uh, if, if the jumping space is not met, then soft and hard tissue recession has been recorded uh, in a lot of cases. Uh, the disadvantage of using a larger diameter implant in your anterior uh, cases is that it will move your implant platform more towards the buckle and it will uh, compromise your emergence profile of your uh, final processes. Next, sir. So you've, you've extracted, you've placed the implant. Now comes the question of whether you are going to, you've decided whether you're going to do an immediate or a, a socket graft. You've gone for an immediate implant. Now, how or in what cases will you go for an immediate loading? So there are a few conditions, namely intact socket walls. If you've got a facial bone wall of at least one mm, a thick soft tissue to, uh, and uh, no acute infection, if you've got good epical bone and lingual to provide the primary stability, primary stability is achieved only from your epical and your lingual bone. So these are your mother load of bone for your immediate implant. And, you, and if you're able to achieve an insertion torque of 25 to 40 newtons and an occlusal scheme, which allows for protection of your provisional restoration, you can go ahead with your uh, immediate placement. Uh, the implant is more stable at, uh, at the time of implant placement. As, the, uh, as uh, time goes on, the uh, stability of the implant reduces. Uh, the bone to implant contact is also reduces. At the end of the third month, usually it is only 60% of bone which, is, uh, which has formed and which is in contact with the implant. So, uh, and at the third to the four, fifth week is the time where the implant is most uh, viable to failure. So uh, if we load it at the proper time, we can uh, try and avoid and uh, get a good facial lingual and, uh, uh, um, and uh, soft tissue regeneration at the, at the same time. The next slide, sir. Then we have a subgroup of therapies. We've got uh, the partial extraction therapies. So here we've uh, used the tooth itself to offset the loss of the alveolar tissue. This is getting more traction nowadays, but the issue is that we have a lot of case reports in the literature, but uh, a long-term study is yet to be uh, uh, published. So what this basically does is it retains the tooth root and its attachment to the bone. Uh, the, so the bundle bone and the periodontal ligament complex and its vascular supply is maintained. So basically the bundle bone is retained and this prevents the atrophy of your uh, restual ridge. The tooth shield is left inside and you place an implant. Uh, so, uh, next slide, please. So in under your group of partial extraction therapies, you have the socket shield technique, pontic shield and root, root submergence. Your pontic shield and your root submergence are procedures done where uh, in your pontic spaces, so in pontic shield, you leave your, uh, uh, these are mostly done for your anterior sites, for your aesthetics. So you leave the pontic shield in, inside and you graft the entire site with a xenograft and suture it. The shield is inside, thereby preventing alveolar uh, bone loss and maintaining the proper alveolar contours. Uh, and root submergence is again the same. You leave the entire root inside, you remove the pulp and you leave the entire root inside and you suture it. Again, this is used in the pontic spaces. Socket shield is where you, you make the shield and you also place an implant side by side and you graft the distance between the shield and the implant. And this stays on. So this will ensure that the, again that the buccal bone is not uh, uh, atrophying and it maintains a soft tissue uh, also on the, on the side. Next slide, sir. Coming to the graft materials, uh, you've got your... You, you know that there are four types of grafts. You, you are autografts, your allografts, xenograft, and alloplasts. Now, in socket preservation cases, you need to choose a graft which easily resorbs and gets easily 
uh, integrated and uh, where it, it incorporates quickly because you cannot wait for 10 months or 12 months for the bone graft to take up and then go in. So, uh, so in such cases, allografts are preferred. So allografts, you, the most commonly used ones are mineralized corticocancellous graft. So mineralized uh, cortical uh, grafts, the advantage of mineralized cortical graft is that it stays for a longer time. The uh, mineralized cancellous graft gets incorporated quickly. So by mixing both of these grafts, you get a graft material which can maintain the space and incorporates quickly. So this is basically an osteoconductive. And you can also go in for the mineralized cortical and demineralized uh, cortical combination. So uh, in the ratio of 70 is, is to 30. This has an osteoconductive and osteoinductive form. So the mineralized cortical bone will again maintain the space and the demineralized cortical will uh, incorporate quickly. Uh, why this combination of mineralized and demineralized? Because your mineralized cortical will take a longer time for the osteoclast to resolve because it is still mineralized. Whereas your demineralized gets resolved quickly and is easily incorporated. Now, when you come to the xenografts, it is more of a porcine or a bovine source. They are basically deep proteinized bone, which resembles inorganic hydroxyapatite. They are very slow resorbing with studies showing the graft particles still inside, even after 44 months, even after nine years of uh, surgery. Uh, so uh, this is a very slow re resorbing and it is good for space maintenance. So in cases where you're doing an immediate implant, it is better that you go in for a graft which stays for a longer time so that it, it gives you a structural uh, stability while uh, bone regeneration happens. So in cases of your immediate implants, you can go in for a slow resorbing xenograft or a slow resorbing hydroxyapatite. And when you want to go in for your uh, uh, socket preservation where you need a uh, quicker bone formation, you can go in for allografts or your beta TCTs. Next slide, sir. So the next we'll, uh, so the membranes, you have about two, mem two types of membranes, resorbable and non-resorbable. So your collagen membranes are the most uh, commonly used uh, membranes. They are very easy to adapt and uh, there is no need for a second surgery to remove it. Uh, but you will need to uh, completely, you will need to achieve primary closure when you're using your collagen membranes. Uh, so in an open socket, you cannot use a collagen membrane because it will uh, disintegrate quite quickly. Whereas in your non-resorbable membranes, you have your dense uh, PTFE membrane. Uh, there is uh, the need for a second surgery to re remove the membrane. But in your extraction sockets, a uh, DPTFE can be left open to your oral cavity because it is dense, it, is not, uh, it prevents the entry of microorganisms and saliva into your uh, uh, graft site and it holds its form. So a DPTFE is uh, acceptable to be left open into your oral cavity. So in cases where you feel that you cannot achieve proper primary closure, a DPTFE would be the better option when you're grafting. Next slide, sir. So I, I hope I would have uh, been able to give you a rough idea on how to select for your... Uh, socket grafting or your immediate implant. So these are a little bit of uh, more literature which you can download and read, which will give you more uh, data on what I've just told you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Abhinav. That is uh, a very concise way of putting up with this, what is considered very contemporary in the entire world right now, because I guess the philosophy is changing. We are going into more preservation, but we need to understand what we are doing. I mean, just because we have a socket, you don't fill that socket. That's a very good concept, which we need to understand because that yes. you get it only by experience. You would have put the broadest implant, primary stability grade, mm -hmm. loaded, but a few years down the line, you start seeing- A uh, recession is, yes. Processing, right, in a, in a, in a aesthetic zone, all those things, it comes by experience, right? But yes, exactly. you can also learn by somebody else's experience. That's the bottom line in, in having these type of webinars. And we hope that we are recording a lot of Q&As and then we will take it from there. As I've mentioned earlier, like we are not covering every aspect of minor oral surgery, but I guess like we are chosen things which are much more contemporary, much more important, but the principles remain the same. We do have our last speaker for the day, like who's going to actually give us what precautions we need to take? When do you have to tread carefully in the slippery path of minor oral surgery? Over to Dr. Yogananda. 
you know, Dr. Saranan, uh, after I got to yoga speak, I think we have the cases, uh, right? Yes, we do have a lot of yeah. cases to discuss, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, because then we are going to put everybody's in, we are going to take almost everything from the Q&A session also. Uh, yeah, sure. thank you. Thank you, thank you. Dr. Yoga? You are muted, Yoga, you are muted. Yoga, you are muted. Huh? And we can't hear you, Yoga. Now, sir? Uh, yeah. yeah, yeah, we can, we can. Yeah. Yes, sir. Well, good afternoon, one and all, respect to President, Secretary, and uh, Dr. Saravanan, uh, who is moderating the session, and all my uh, fellow panelists. It has been a great uh, session listening to you all. And uh, as Dr. Saran was saying, we have not, uh, it'll practically be not possible to cover every aspect of oral surgery. And I'd, uh, I was, uh, like to convey that nothing about oral surgery is minor. It's uh, uh, oral surgery in uh, office setup or your uh, practice. The chair side oral surgery is what we are uh, currently talking. And I'm here to sum up some of the routine complications and risk assessment and management that we may need to incorporate to ensure uh, a smooth uh, delivery of uh, oral surgical procedures in office-based setup. And probably the biggest complication and risk management in the current era is uh, not contracting COVID-19 and probably not transmitting it uh, either to the patients. Probably that is going to be the biggest challenge in the uh, days to come. And I, I hope things ease out. And uh, I would also like to put it across that uh, oral surgery is like mathematics. Uh, the surgeon needs to be principled and you need to follow the principles uh, to stay at bay and give good uh, results to the optimal uh, results to the patient. And uh, office-based oral surgery always remains a constant challenge because you're in a less controlled environment and you're the master there and every decision you make there directly affects the outcome and deliverance of care to the patient. Next slide, please. As a disclaimer, oral surgery under local anesthetic is at best uncomfortable for the patient and at its worst, an extraordinary and traumatic business because the patient is fully awake, fully aware, and they probably know what is happening inside their oral cavity. Next slide, please. A diagnostic oversight, this is something we all need to ponder upon because as, as we gain experience, two, two things happen. We do a lot of our, our work improves, our outcomes improve, but at the same time, we develop something called uh, oversight. Uh, we, we end up deciding that uh, everything could be the same. It is not so because in the fascia maxillary region, most of the condition are either orontogenic or periodontal or salivary gland origin apart from the uh, malignancies, resulting in caries, periapical diseases, face infection, orontogenic cyst tumors of the jaw and face. So what happens is clinically and radiologically, most of the findings are similar. And here is what uh, the problem comes, experience helps and experience hinders because what is common is mostly common and what is rare is always rare. And we need to remember and always uh, understand every patient, every condition is different. And it is prudent and mandatory that we don't initiate any treatment till a definitive diagnosis is re uh, reached. So it's probably best to avoid uh, rendering a treatment at the very first time the patient comes to your practice. So you need to have uh, a good diagnosis, a proper diagnosis, which is uh, supported by adjunctive uh, methods like your uh, X-rays, OPG, or your CBCT. And like Dr. Saumathan sir was telling in the very first uh, uh, session, a diagnosis is very, very important uh, before you can go ahead and render a treatment. Next slide, please. And some of the contributing factors to the complications that we, we may face is the age of the patient, experience of the surgeon, and most importantly, the duration of the procedure. Office-based oral surgery has a set time limit. You are not in a controlled environment. You just cannot go about on and on and on. So the most important thing that comes here is you know your skill set. You know the limitations of your practice. You make sure that you have good equipment, armamentarium, good support staff, and everything about your office is competent enough to handle a patient who walks into your office for the oral surgical procedure. So the duration of the procedure, 
experience and skill set of the surgeon, uh, the age and health of the patient, all this plays a very important role in determining good optimal outcome in oral surgery. Next slide, please. So if you look at the preoperative complications can broadly be classified into three. One is a preoperative complication, another is intraoperative and the postoperative complication that can happen post, before and after oral surgery uh, procedures. Preoperative complications purely arise because of your uh, oversight in not assessing the health history of the patient and health history could include a whole uh, set of things. It could be an untreated condition. It could be for something which the patient is undergoing medication or could be a condition for which the patient has been previously operated. So many things come into the health history. Or it could be a congenital anomaly. It could be a blood dyskrasiasis, or it could, it could be because of a cardiovascular or a, a cerebrovascular uh, episode. The patient could be on antiplatelet or anticoagulant therapy. It could be a patient undergoing uh, dialysis. It could be a patient who is hypoglycemic. Uh, could be a syndromic patient who's on uh, support of uh, steroids or rheumatic heart disease. The gamut is open. I mean, like uh, there is no, uh, the, the, uh, in the current scenario, uh, what was once deemed diseases of the geriatric population now is a lifestyle disorder, like di di diabetes mellitus or your hypertension or your cardiovascular conditions are all more of a lifestyle disorder. So always assume a patient who walks into your practice uh, could be a potential challenge for you. And there is no excuse for not eliciting a good clinical history a good health history, uh, ascertaining what medications suit the patient, what medications the patient on, what modifications you need to render the treatment uh, possible for these uh, patients. All this needs to be taken into care and there is uh, simply no excuse for not doing that. So these are, uh, the, you can have a whole gamut as I told you, it could be because of the anxiety of the patient, it could be a, a, a syncopic episode or it could be a hypoglycemic episode, it could be a drug allergy, anything can happen in a preoperative situation, it can happen in the waiting area, it can happen on the chair. It can happen during the procedure. It can happen when the patient is waiting outside post procedure. So this uh, complication, you really, really need to look out when you're assessing the health history of the patient. Next slide, please. And <clears throat> it could be the entire spectrum. It could be uh, bleeding in the oral cavity, or it could be a, a acute cardiac failure, or it could be a, the patient can have a acute drug uh, drug uh, uh, manifestation happening, allergy manifestation, manifesting in the uh, OP. Anything can happen. So you need to be really, really careful about your preoperative health history of the patient. Next slide, please. Intraoperative complications and postoperative complications. I have broadly classified that into about 10 uh, complications that one can experience both intraoperatively and uh, immediate postoperative period. Next slide, please. So, <clears throat> The most important thing to prevent any complication from happening is good pain management, uh, ascertaining that the patient is comfortable on your chair and never presuming that when the patient says he or she has got pain, don't assume that your blockers work fantastically well. And when the patient say he or she is in pain, there is a good probability that he or she is in pain. So good pain management, as like everybody here previously speaking, where uh, Dr. Saumatra and Dr. Shalo, who were all speaking, pain management is very, very important in oral surgery for the simple reason that uh, episode of pain, un unbearable pain can result in shock. Pain shock can happen anytime on the uh, chair. Anxiety for pain can induce a syncope. So many things can happen because of uh, poor pain management. So uh, knowing the anatomy, knowing your anesthetic technique, knowing the choice of anesthesia, uh, anesthetic solution that you're going to use for the patient, knowing the health history of the patient and modifying the anesthetic agent that you're going to use, or whether you need any ancillary uh, uh, conscious sedation procedure. And most importantly, deciding whether you will be able to do the procedure under local anesthesia and office setup, or you need to shift the patient or refer the patient to a higher center to do a pain-free procedure. All this is important. Next slide, please. So uh, this Dr. Samutin was uh, already telling the basic necessity, good light, uh, good assistance, uh, fluid, uh, avoiding fluid contamination. And clinically, you need to examine the patient. It's very important oral surgery. If the patient has got adequate mouth opening, look at the tongue size. Tongue size is one of the major impediment to oral surgery procedure, especially if you're doing an impaction or a transalveolar extraction. The tongue size needs to be look. A macroglossic uh, tongue is very, very difficult to manage because retraction is going to be a 
huge challenge and when you're doing your uh, bone guttering or when you're using high speed instruments in the oral cavity whether it's a, a simple extraction or transalveolar or impaction or implant placement the tongue is going to be a huge impediment and mouth opening the intercommissure distance of the oral cavity all that <clears throat> and uh, tmd problems uh, if the patient has got any history of uh, temporomandibular joint uh, diseases all that needs to be looked before you start the procedure and also look at the uh, ridge of the patient, age of the patient, because the plane of anesthesia varies in an adult patient, adolescent patient, a pediatric patient, and a geriatric patient. So you need to be very, very careful when you're looking at the height of the bone, the quality of the bone, the age of the patient before you give an anesthetic. All this uh, is very, very important to avoid a complication subsequently. Next slide, please. Yeah, uh, next slide, please. So when the, the very failure to look into all those little details before you start doing a surgical procedure, oral surgical procedure chair side, is when routine situations becomes extraordinary situations as the very famous adage goes, failing to prepare is preparing to fail. So when you don't take these precautions, when you try to skip an important step or the essential principles of uh, doing oral surgery in a chair side setup, that is when complications arise. Next slide, please. So again, to just uh, to sum it up before we go into the complication, proper diagnosis and preoperative planning, training and ability to assess individual situation and limitation, application of principles and proper instrumentation, instrumentation with uh, adequate facilities. Next slide, please. So the most important thing that you can uh, face in your uh, oral surgical procedure is bleeding. Blood gushing into the oral cavity will bring anybody to the knees. The most experienced surgeon will be on his knees if he's not able to control uh, bleeding inside the oral cavity. Mind you, it is, uh, it is uh, most, uh, most of the senior surgeons would accept with that blood gushing into the oral cavity can literally stop your heart because there is no way you don't know what to do. Suctioning will not stop. Your gauze packs will not stop. And that is a very, very, very important uh, thing that you try and avoid. So you always make sure that you're looking at a healthy patient. You are certain that he or she does not have a, a history of blood dyscrasias or hemocongenital anomalies like uh, hemophilia or one willibrans or any uh, deficiency, fractal deficiency of the intrinsic pathway. So it, is, uh, it may sound irrelevant uh, asking them to do a blood investigation for a healthy patient, but always it helps. So make sure that you do a CBC or at least a, a bleeding time, clotting time, or prothrombin time with INR. And the values, they play a very, very important role, less than 1, 1 1.2 to 1.6, greater than 1.6, whether the patient is on any antiplatelet therapy or anticoagulant therapy, if he or she is on any antiplatelet or anticoagulant therapy, do we need to discontinue, when to discontinue, or should we put them on bridge therapy with clexin, subcutaneous heparin before we do the procedure? What is the time frame when you stop the heparin and then do the oral surgery procedure? All this. All this matters uh, to avoid a bleeding episode in the oral cavity. And the second most important thing is understanding the anatomic principles, where to place the incision, the length of the incision, how we severe the mucoperiosteal attachment from the underlying bone, the sharp instruments that you use, all that again matters. And when you put back uh, the tissues, how we suture, everything matters to avoid, uh, a good, uh, avoid bleeding and have a good hemostasis post-procedure. So management will always include pre-op investigation. If the patient is on a uh, known uh, cardiac or a cerebrovascular patient on antiplatelet or anticoagulant treatment modification, you definitely need to have a good sound surgical technique. If you are working on a very compromised patient, it is best to refer the patient to a higher center or before the procedure in a controlled environment. And always make sure that uh, you know how to go about managing and protecting yourself uh, when uh, the patient, when such an episode arises in your practice. Next slide, please. Yeah, this, uh, this was a very unlucky day. This was a case of one willibrans disease. This patient had gone to uh, so many dentists. When he gave his health history, he refused to treat him. So he came to us and he did not give us history. And uh, his BTCT reports he was carrying seemed to be normal, uh, but once Nothing was done, but a vertical release incision was placed for this patient. That is the amount of bleeding that uh, happened. Finally, this patient had to be shifted and 
<coughs> FFP saved him. And he had a couple of other episodes also that uh, happened to him. Somehow we still surviving like that. Uh, Uttamapu villain, Kamala Hassan, Nrithu Jai. Nothing has happened to him. Tachuri is still uh, lucky and surviving despite all the odds. Next slide, please. Any more post-operative swelling with any, any minor oral surgery procedure, you are bound to expect some uh, varying degrees of uh, post-operative edema and uh, some amount of swelling, but this broadly, as it, it is an accepted co uh, complication. It is response of tissue to manipulation and trauma caused during surgery. The minimal the trauma, uh, the lesser the uh, accepted duration of the procedure, lesser will be the post-operative uh, swelling and edema. It is uh, gradual onset. It peaks at about uh, 24 to 48 hours and it begins to regress from 4-3 onwards, and complete resolution occurs at about uh, seven days. Uh, as I told you, it's directly proportional to the degree of tissue trauma, how your assistant is retracting or how you are holding the tissues and how you're placing the incision, the amount of bone cutting, the, uh, the degree of thermal necrosis that you can avoid to the underlying bone, all that uh, helps. So your management could be corticosteroids. You can, like uh, Dr. Shalu was telling, you can give it preoperatively or you can give immediate postoperative. Uh, the choice usually remains uh, between dexamethasone. We give about 2 cc, 8 mg of uh, injection dexamethasone. <clears throat> and we prefer to give dexamethasone because it's got a greater half-life and it prevents uh, the formation of thromboxin and prostaglandin E2, which again help and uh, uh, supports the analgesic effect also. So reduces pain also. So any man post-operative swelling goes with any minor surgical procedure you expect it but it is uh, prudent that you know how to manage it. Next slide, please. Uh, if you have the facility and access, if you're an institution, depending on the degree of uh, swelling, you can, if the patient is on IP, you can also think of cryotherapy or ice application. Next slide, please. Uh, but again, this uh, ice application is only for the first or immediate post-operative day. Continuous application without uh, uh, periods of intermission can cause uh, uh, vascular necrosis. So you need to be careful with how long you do the ice application. It's re usually recommended only on the first or immediate uh, post-operative day. So usually we say them to keep for a period of five minutes and then give up a recess of about 15 to 20 minutes so that uh, the vessels, you know, again become vascular and that is how you do ice application. You don't place it continuously and you don't go beyond the first uh, POD. A trismus again is an uh, expected outcome in some of the oral surgical procedure, if not everything, if not all the uh, procedure. Trismus is evaluated by the intra-incisal distance at maximal mouth opening and <clears throat> most of the common reasons why you have trismus postoperatively is begins with the injection technique, especially with your inferior alveolar nerve block, if you go a little too deep, if you inject or deposit intramuscular deposition of the local anesthetic agent, especially those with adrenaline, can definitely release and uh, result in uh, your uh, postoperative Christmas. Another thing is the distal release, release incision. I think Dr. Saumatran sir was showing it in the very first presentation. The length of the distal incision, if you severe the attachment of the tendon, temporalis tendon, definitely you're going to land up with Christmas post your uh, impaction procedure. So you need to be very, very careful about with your distal release incisions. But a routine Christmas, those that are caused by post-operative edema and swelling, you do have some amount of restriction in mouth opening because of your uh, uh, edema. So that resolves usually by the uh, fourth day onwards. And uh, in some rare occasions, when you're doing some procedures like uh, intramaxillary fixation or you've done IMF and then releasing it, you're bound to expect some moment of Christmas because the muscles have been in a state of spasm. So for those patients, you can suggest a muscle relaxant and then you can put them on isometric mouth opening exercise and you don't try to do something heroic and don't try uh, re-establishing mouth opening very immediately. So that causes further damage. So Christmas management would include analgesics, corticosteroids, isometric uh, mouth opening exercises, and caution, as I told you, inferior alveolar block into the muscles of mastication. And another thing is the distal release incision when you're doing a transalveolar extractions or your impactions. Next slide, please. Uh, pain management, again, is an expected post-surgical morbidity. Uh, it uh, begins when the effect of your local anesthetic begins to subside and peak levels reach in six to 12 hours. Uh, you, you are bound to have pain, but it should be a manageable and acceptable pain, or it should be a pain that 
results when you take a oral or parenteral NSAID or opioids. Again, the choice of your uh, post-operative analgesic definitely varies. You need to look into the health history of the patient. Say, suppose you're prescribing the patient on a three-day or a five-day analgesic course, depending on the procedure you've done. You need to ascertain if it's a diabetic patient, if it's a geriatric patient, if it's a diabetic patient, if it's an uncontrolled diabetic previously, can you go about giving NSAIDs or if the patient is a uh, known uh, CKD patient, those are on chronic kidney disease, and if they are on dialysis, can you go about giving a routine NSAIDs or do you need to switch into opioids or you totally need to avoid NSAIDs and opioids or you, you need to look into other substitutes and other forms of pain management. All these things is very, very important and uh, necessary when you're looking into the choice of uh, analgesics that you prescribe to the uh, patient. And some, some of this NSAID is opioid analgesic, uh, also uh, induce nausea and vomiting and uh, makes the patient feel sleepy and lighter. So all this, uh, uh, you need to know about the drug that you're prescribing to the patient, although you accept pain as an accepted surgical uh, morbidity, expected surgical morbidity. Next slide, please. Uh, infection, infection is uh, something that uh, you can definitely avoid, but uh, one, one, one of the most uncommon surgical complications is infection, and it could be anything ranging from uh, wound basins, or it could be a, a ab abs abscess formation, or it could be a, a alveolar rostitis. Infection can be anything in the uh, oral cavity, and it begins with your improper surgical technique, uh, not complying with the surgical principles, uh, asepsis and sterilization not being adequate. Uh, if the uh, underlying health history, comorbid conditions like diabetes mellitus are overlooked, and uh, if the patient does not exercise good glycemic control post-surgical procedure, all this can result in a post-operative infection. So you need to counsel the patient much before the procedure if they are a, a compromised patient, the importance of having a good oral hygiene, uh, maintaining good health uh, to prevent any post-operative infections from happening. So then again, a choice of management would be to start on antibiotic therapy. If, if there is any uh, abscess formation, you need to do a pus culture sensitivity and determine which antibiotic will be appropriate for the patient to treat the post-operative infection. And always, uh, as a caution, there should not be any antibiotic abuse. So you need, once, once you have uh, the pus culture sensitivity, then you need to switch on to the uh, antibiotic that would be most sensitive to the cause of the patient. So infection is something that can be easily avoided if you take adequate uh, precautions and uh, counsel the patient and uh, maintain a good oral health post-surgery. Next slide, please. Uh, this again, the principles of lab design, like Dr. Samuthan was telling in his first presentation, uh, principles play a long way in uh, preventing post-operative uh, infection because they, the designs of the flap that we use to expose the uh, expose and treat the underlying condition uh, has a great effect on avoiding the post-operative complication because adequate perfusion and adequate vascularity to the flap that you put back together ensures that the wound heals unevenly. So if you design the flap uh, without the uh, requisite principles, if, say suppose uh, if you uh, prepare the vertical release incision, which is like compromised, and if the base of the flap is not wider than the uh, apex of the flap, you can definitely result in a buttonhole closure. You can, it will cause uh, tight approximation of the tissues and that will result in a wound essence and that will lead to a post-operative infection if the underlying uh, site is exposed, surgical site is exposed. So you need to be very, very uh, adherent to the principles of the procedure. Next slide, please. Alveolar status, again, another form of infection, uh, what you call commonly as your dry socket. It could happen with uh, transcellular extractions. It could uh, happen with your impactions when the wound aces and the disturbance in healing occurs after the formation of a mature clot before the clot is replaced with granulation tissue because of uh, premature clot necrosis or loss. Uh, and it, the characteristic feature of your alveolar status, how you identify is it is accompanied by excruciating pain and what you call as fetal or as uncontrollable order. Uh, it's a bad order that the patient experiences and you can uh, elicit clinically also. The main reason being fibrolysis, especially when the patient fails to comply with your post-extraction instruction, like not to spit, not to gargle for the next 24 hours, not to consume anything hot. All this, when, uh, when any, any 
thing that the patient does because of his health or because of uh, not complying with the post uh, extraction instructions that results in excess fibrinolysis can result in your alveolar osteitis or your dry socket. So prevention, once the alveolar osteitis sets in, the management would be uh, irrigation with chloroxidin, saline, a topical placement of an antibiotic. You can, uh, you can debride the granulation tissue, again, induce fresh bleeding and try and approximate the uh, tissues. And then put, you can, uh, eugenol dressing has all been tried, but it, it does offer some remedy and then you put the patient on antibiotic therapy. But the best thing is to try and avoid alveolar status because it gives excruciating pain to the patient. Next slide, please. Uh, nerve disturbances, again, major uh, problem is like, especially when you're doing a periapical surgery in the uh, premolar region where you can uh, severe the uh, mental nerve or when implant placements in the canine first premolar region where the mental nerve makes a C loop. Although you can, I, you, that is why the CBCT uh, definitely uh, comes into play when you're doing a mandibular canine impaction, the position of the mental nerve, the exit of the mental nerve from the mental foramen, all that needs to be assessed. And flap retraction during impaction procedure, uh, during a third molar surgery, is the lingual flap, especially if you uh, strip the lingual periosteum too much, you can injure the lingual nerve. And most commonly, uh, the nerve that is injured is an inferior alveolar and neurovascular bundle, but most of the inferior neurovascular bundle uh, injuries usually resolve. Uh, one that definitely doesn't resolve is your lingual nerve injury. It is a very, very challenging situation because the patient will not be able to appreciate any sense of taste or uh, any sensation on one half of the tongue. So that is a very, very uh, difficult situation for the patient. So lingual nerve injury should be avoided at uh, all, all situations. And uh, the degree of injury depends on the type of injury that you've caused to the nerve and uh, it can result in varying levels of uh, neurosensory deficit. Like I told you, inferior nerve uh, injury usually recovers. Lingual nerve injury can be permanent with or without loss of taste. So management uh, depending uh, recovers and uh, the pattern of uh, the disturbance and probably you will have to uh, micro neurovascular procedures may require when there is permanent loss. One condition that I have found confounding is uh, very, very challenging is something called, I don't know, uh, we will take this up for discussion. There's a condition called anesthesia dolorosa, uh, the, where you everything is fine. Uh, the healing site is fine. The extraction socket has uh, healed. But the site of your local anesthesia, the patient has a constant pain and uh, burning sensation. So this uh, anesthesia dolorosa is uh, associated with one of the nerve dis disturbances, but not much literature in the uh, uh, dental uh, uh, in oral surgical uh, journals that I looked into, but it's something I think we should uh, take up for uh, discussion subsequently. So nerve disturbances, try and watch out and uh, <clears throat> usually uh, try and avoid. Next slide, please. Maxillary tuberosity fractures, oroantral communications, I've just clubbed it into, no, no, I've clubbed it into, it's one slide, oroantral communications and tuberosity fractures. That's why seven and nine is coming. I just saw that. It's a uh, grave complication. Uh, oroantral communication usually happens in the uh, maxillary uh, third molar region, uh, very rarely in near the second premolar region, maxillary first, second uh, uh, region. What happens is like a, a traumatic extraction uh, creating a frank communication between the maxillary sinus and the oral cavity. Immediately visible, uh, it can be elicited uh, on the chassis. That's where, like, once you have your uh, x-rays, you need to ascertain how low the floor of the sinus is in proximity to the tooth that is being extracted. Uh, and uh, if you have an oroantral communication, if it is minimal, uh, it, it usually you can manage with your buccal flap, but if it is on the palatal aspect, then probably you'll have to consider any of your uh, palatal flap that needs to be rotated and uh, closed. Tuberosity fracture is a very grave complication. Uh, uncontrolled force delivered at the time of third molar extraction, it can result in torrential bleed and life-threatening hemorrhage because of the pterygoid, uh, proximity of the pterygoid plexus, uh, tearing of the maxillary sinus lining, and uh, when the tuberosity is fractured, it renders subsequent prosthodontic management also difficult. And 
I saw very rare complications, less reported complications. You had uh, a deafness and uh, management would be like, try and not take the uh, tibro, uh, fracture tuberosity region, uh, try and splint or try and do a rigid procedure. And if you realize the tuberosity is fractured, splint it with the second molar and defer the extraction of it. So that is how you look into tuberosity fractures and management of oroenteral communication, you can do it immediately which on the buckle, your mesio buckle or visto buckle, you can uh, advance a flap and close, or you can take a buckle fat pad and then uh, give a two layer closure. Or if it's on the palatal socket, and if you will not be able to uh, bring the buckle flap into approximation, then take a palatal flap, or you can do a combination of both your palatal and your buckle flap if you want to give a better cover, because advancing the buckle tissue more towards palatally will result in difficulty in mouth opening because you will be obliterating the vestibule space. So you need to be very careful with your uh, uh, closure technique. To do that, you need to ascertain which uh, socket, which of the three sockets is uh, having the communication. So you need to take uh, repeat the x-ray and then see whether it's the on the buckle side or on the palatal side and this, then decide uh, what type of flap closure you will be needing. Next slide, please. Another rare complication, fracture of the mandible of the lingual cortical plate. Like I told you, it's rare, but it's a severe uh, compl uh, complication, multifactorial reasons. The most common being brute force that is being used to try and luxate the tooth. Uh, when the tooth, they, we usually understand that if the tooth does not uh, luxate to your normal forces of extraction, that means there is an obstacle that is still there or the tooth is not in a favorable position in the path of exit. So you need to go uh, redo your assessment and then relieve the uh, difficulties and then split or whatever tooth split technique, what needs to be done, you need to do and then do. And it, sometimes it's again overset because you don't have a CBCT, you have a two-dimensional X-ray. If you fail to identify uh, the lingual version of the tooth and if you give excessive force, you can fracture the lingual cortical plate or worst come worst situation, you can fracture the mandible, especially that, that was the way I was telling you the very first uh, part of the talk, uh, the height of the mandible, the width of the mandible, the age of the patient that whom you're doing the procedure on all that uh, matters. So you need to have careful preoperative evaluation. If you find that the tooth is uh, not placed in a favorable path of exit, uh, recognize if you have the competency to perform the uh, procedure. Worst come worse, if the surgical execution fails and the mandible or the cortical plate fractures, then you should be prepared to do a ORIF, chair side ORIF, at least a superior border plating or do a uh, intermaxillary fixation before you shift the patient to a higher center. Next slide, please. So that gives a broad gist of all the possible complication you can have post your oral surgical procedures in your office setup uh, on a chair side basis. And in conclusion, you can't count your stars every day. So whenever oral surgery is contemplated for treatment, one should reflect on the limitations and equipment, preparedness to execute the procedure, competency to handle the complications, adequate inform confirm to the patient, especially in this era of medical legal uh, litigation that we are facing and medical legal uh, negligence suits that we are being uh, subjected to, and never ever forget to prefer, refer, or defer. Know what you can, do what you can, and do it in a setup where you can. So that would be uh, the best way to avoid complications in oral surgery in a chair side office-based uh, setup. Thank you, sir. Thank you all. Thank you, Dr. Yoga. That is, I think we have exceeded the time in the presentations. However, I think all the presentations were so comprehensive that I think there's a lot of take home message in that. Now we have a few cases, I guess like we are going to cut short on the cases in the discussion wise so that we don't want to really overshot the time. However, we try to give some variety in the cases. There are a lot of Q and A which have been answered already, but we will try and address a few in the live discussions as well. Uh, now to start with, uh, I thank all the panelists, but right now I am going to invite almost every panelist to uh, give their expert opinion. Now, the first case, what you're going to see is about impactions, canine impactions. Could I request Dr. Shalu, who has actually uh, given this case to tell us about this patient, uh, ma'am? Yeah. 
Thank you, sir. Uh, this is actually a 15 year female patient who was referred to the oral surgery department. Why ortho department for the surgical multiple of the teeth? You can actually see this intraoral photographs, and this is the OPG, and we can easily appreciate that lower anteriors are impacted from canine to canine. We have to, when we are talking about impaction, we have to consider what exactly is the etiopathogenesis, why so many tooth are, teeth are impacted, whether it is related to any syndrome or what exactly is lying inside uh, this situation. So we have gone, run through, we have done the, obviously the routine clinical examination thoroughly, both intraorally, extraorally, we have taken detailed history. The patient was not uh, telling us anything. Then we have run through few investigations and the patient was found to be have a history of parathyroid hormones. And the patient was referred to the general physician for same. After the treatment of approximately one and a half to two months, uh, the patient was again referred back to us and um, for the eruption so that ortho people can start giving the moment. Uh, can you please go to the next slide, sir? In the CBCT, when we have gone through uh, the CBCT, in spite of the canine, it was a lateral incisors, bilaterally, especially uh, the right side, which is dilacerated. I don't know whether it is clear or not. And uh, which was hooked towards the lower border of the mandible. Uh, as per ortho department, they cannot uh, uh, give its proper plates into the oral cavity. So in spite of canine, it will go for a, a disimpaction later on. This case is right now running and it is just three months back uh, case in our department. Uh, and <clears throat> Thanks, uh, Dr. Shalu. Um, Dr. Ann, now, when it comes to these type of patients who have got a complex medical history, I mean, of course, uh, altered parathormone level is going to alter the bone metabolism anyway. Now, these type of patients, what precautions would you take before undertaking any surgical, orthodontic, or any combined therapies, ma'am? I didn't catch what her, her, her medical problem was. Uh, she has got a parathyroid deficiency, I take oh, it. Okay. So, okay. That is, so obviously it is okay. going to affect the bone metabolism. Yeah, I think you'd have a discussion, you have a discussion with the endocrinologist as to the risk that would be involved in any surgery um, and you know what, what the cover should be if you actually anticipate doing surgery. And then from the surgical point of view, you need to work out which, whether it's, whether you can actually act, what you can actually access, what the relationship of the teeth is to the mental nerve and the inferior dental, dental nerve. Um, and also from the point of view, orthodontically, surgically, how many teeth can you fit into the arch? How can you actually orthodontically correct it? Um, and then obviously, um, if there's a risk with um, post-operative infection, how are you going to cover her um, antibiotic-wise um, and um, you know, the appropriate management in that way? Great, ma'am. Uh, Samantran, sir, your opinion, please, sir. Samantran, sir? Second. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah, I'll also uh, agree with what Collins is telling. You need an endocrinological consultation and uh, see the pros and cons, uh, whether you can take up for surgery and the things like that. And maybe uh, as uh, Shalu has already told, there's a dilaceration, all the things. So mostly it has to be disimpacted. And uh, so you have to plan, you know, uh, how safely you remove it out and plan in different way. Uh, the space can be put by an implant or by creating space and uh, uh, other various options are there nowadays. So you can think of or making a, uh, if, it is a if it's a canine, you can make it lateral in the shape of a canine. A lot of aesthetic work also can be done and has to do it uh, very safely. And uh, if really indicated, you have to go for the removal. Uh, Yogaji, a specific question regarding if this is the only investigation which you are you are having, would you be happy even if that patient is already sort of like medically healthy, no other issues, or would you certainly prefer to have these type of uh, uh, CBCT image when you see multiple impactions? Def definitely you need to go in for a CBCT, sir. Uh, it would be the most prudent thing to do, especially like I told you. Uh, it exactly, see this, what if you go back to the OPG, you will not be able to see this cut one tooth overlying the other. What a two-dimensional image has its sets of uh, limitation because this image will give you an understanding of what is there. But when you take a CBCT, you know 
how we are going to go about managing it especially if you look at the uh, lower right uh, corner slide you can look at the orientation of the teeth it's practically uh, one above the other so how we are going to access how much bone you stand to lose and and more importantly the exit of the metal now if you look at uh, both the lateral incisor and the uh, canine on the uh, i think the right side and if you look at both the other impact to the canine and the premolar on the left side you can see the black dot there uh, i think it's a uh, metal for a man looking at the image so you probably know where to place your uh, incision the important what we have the third eye when we are talking about yeah. these type of ones we need to look at it in the third dimension uh, it, it, it is very to... mandatory it is mandatory sir yeah great plate safe uh, if we quickly go on to this case like uh, uh, dr shalu would you just tell us like what uh, you are looking at in this particular patient uh, this patient is having pericoronitis and uh, when we saw intra orally she was having missing upper canine also right side so we have considered the cbct and in cbct obviously canine is impacted upper third molar is impacted and uh, left right upper third molar and left lower third molar is impacted and uh, when we have seen the relation of the mandibular canal with the apex of the tooth uh, i don't know how much clear it is but it is found to be having a darkening of the root with bit of a notch on the mandibular canal so obviously there is a high chances as per root criteria for the anterior alveolar nerve injury so cbct is actually as uh, yogaran sir told it is a third eye we can't agree more as sir has told in the presentation that cbct is a great help to discuss with the patient pertaining to that dr collins now in that part of the world now how much is it medical legally it is important that we discuss the real possibilities of a inferior alveolar nerve damage or alterations for any patients who are undergoing a wisdom tooth surgery and should this patient have post operative paresthesia is that just a written consent is good enough or should you have more evidence that you have taken all precautions uh, uh the the informed consent means that you, they must be well aware of the um possibility of nerve damage and an understanding of what might occur um and you can go through it with them on the ct scan and explain it all and um you can also i suppose discuss whether you want to the tooth been i take it that this wisdom tooth been infected so it's not suitable for uh coronectomy so you're going to really consider the careful removal of the tooth um uh, surgically i'm assuming that the canine tooth is um in this 26 year old female is asymptomatic and given that it's highly impacted and if it 26 years of age it has not caused any resorption of the adjacent uh uh lateral incisor or central incisor I would probably recommend that that would be monitored on a yearly OPG to see if there was any change. Um but the what you said about the informed consent is extremely important. We have a brochure that comes out through our association through Anzoms which we give to all our patients and obviously we go through it very carefully um and that's part of the written consent that we actually do with the patient at the time. That's very interesting point you have raised ma'am. That is when we talk about asymptomatic impacted teeth now whether they can cause any effects and should they cause how frequently we monitor i guess a guideline is very important we need to have a compliant patient who understands that we have left something other than the normal physiology but which has not become a pathology yet it may or may not become it we have the probabilities but then when we talk something like this we need to be backed up with evidences isn't it ma'am well i would <laughs> I would suggest that if you have a tooth that is totally asymptomatic has no associated pathology has caused no resorption of the other teeth in a patient who is over 25 and that 25 to 30 age group um and you take out the tooth and ca cause something quite significant you will not be a very popular surgeon so that careful discussion and careful monitoring as you say with a compliant patient doing a yearly x-ray is by far the most appropriate management uh, Samantran sir your view on that sir i mean uh, we on the in the last one madam said or we treatment on this case i either way sir either way sir okay okay Both. yeah fine yeah uh, uh, yeah i also would suggest uh, only the lower third molar is having symptoms uh, pericoronitis and things like that so you only have to go and remove that and uh, one or two points i would like to add 
Uh, one is that uh, medical legal issue, you need to get a consent from the patient before surgery and explain to them what is the possibility of definitely a, a sensory disturbance for the patient. As well as uh, you see, there is no first molar or a second molar there. So a possibility of a pathological fracture while doing also should be very carefully uh, mentioned to the patient in the consent. Because you know, if at all somebody, nobody uses a chaser and mallet nowadays, but still some people do, the vertical bone cuts has to be placed before you or do any sort of cuts, you know, very easily, you know, with a very weakened mandible and a tool standing alone uh, to be very careful about the mandibular fracture. And you have to very nicely, as uh, Collins Madam was telling, without damaging much, you have to very carefully take it out and, you know, observe the other upper canine for uh, any changes uh, periodically, you know, six months or one year X-ray, whatever it is. And upright also, if at all, some issues coming can be addressed. Okay, that's all. So in the course of your answer, you brought a very interesting point about chisels and mallets. Now, yeah. because they are probably the most elegant cutting instruments, but we do it nowadays exclusively under general anesthesia for uh, uh, making sure that the patient does not feel the banging of that one, but they are exactly. very elegant, elegant ones. Uh, Dr. Yoga, your thoughts on, like if you are doing it under GA and these type of ones, would you still go in for a rotary instrument or would you prefer a... Uh, a chisel and a mallet, like sometimes, like which are much more like you can do it in no time and a very limited long term damage. I mean, what's your take on it? Yoga? I think, I think Yoga just moved out. Uh, <laughs> Dr. Shalu? He's online, he'll be back. Yeah. So to tell you frankly, uh, if the patient is conscious, I prefer not to use a chisel and mallet. At all. GMM? Yes, sir. Under GA? Under GA, we are having that luxury of the straight hand because we are having the luxury of pesos. We are having that luxuries of lasers. I don't think anybody is using apart from lingual fit technique if somebody wants to give a demonstration for the same. As some of them said, like, uh, well, like nowadays, I think the current generation surgeons, most of them may not get an exposure to chisel mallet at all, isn't it? Like uh, apart from osteotomies. Yeah, yeah, I agree, I agree. Because uh, as uh, Shalu was telling, you have the, you know, if you're drained in piso and you have the system, of course, it is a very safe and uh, nicely you can do it. But still in many centers, uh, when the, there's only one micro motor, it goes wrong or, or get the burnt up, heated up, you know, you could take the old chisel and mallet, but you should be very careful to make the vertical limiting cuts and then connect and do it. Yeah, very elegant. Uh, gee, just uh, the, another... Minor oral surgery is never complete without soft tissue procedures. I've just put one mucos seal on here. Any tips which you would tell your uh, uh, a surgeon who is the budding surgeon or a senior trainee? What would you uh, suggest, sir? A mucos seal of the lower lip. Uh, Samantran, sir? Okay, yeah. Uh, once uh, you have the clinical diagnosis of a uh, mucos seal, the idea will be to excise the whole gland out of the, you know, uh, the bed. So that has to be done very, uh, you should not break and leave some part again, you'll recur it again very soon. Now we have operated many cases, two times, three times like that. So make sure that your entire minor salivary gland along with the duct, the whole thing is taken out and sutured. Uh, that, that will make the things uh, very nice and there won't be any recurrence. So would you make a horizontal incision along the vermilion or would you make, a, make it as a vertical one, sir? I usually uh, go with the horizontal one and you know, nice, the deception part is very, uh, I to be very careful, nicely lift it up and you know, and without breaking, uh, you are carefully, if you do it, you can nicely remove it out. Uh, either way, people use the other way also in that region, it's okay with uh, both the things. So for positive of time, I'm just going to, uh, ma'am, I'm going to skip this one. I'll come back to uh, cases like in this a little later. I'm going to just show one related to uh, an immediate extraction and an implant placement one. Uh, Dr. Abhinav, would you like to explain about this uh, particular yes, issue? Yes, sir. So we had a 24-year-old uh, uh, patient who came with a fractured acetated tooth. So, uh, so he wanted uh, an immediate uh, solution to the missing tooth. So we we took a CBCT and uh, on the cross-section, next, next slide, sir. So on the cross section, we were able to see that uh, we had good bone on the buccal aspect. And if you see over here, uh, we've, I've also showed you the marking. So there's more than uh, one mm of bone. And if you see the tooth is also uh, beyond the apex of the tooth, you have a lot of bone available. 
so we thought we will try so we thought we will try and uh, extract it atraumatically and proceed with an immediate implant next slide sir so atraumatic extraction was done and this is a socket you'll you'll be able to appreciate the buccal bone which is still intact post extraction next slide sir so the drilling was done the advantage of doing the immediate is that the implant can be placed in the anatomic position of the tooth so as you can see from the radiograph on the left side the uh, the uh, position indicating device has gone beyond meaning the drill has gone beyond the apex and engaged in good sound bone so this is very important when you want to achieve good primary stability during your implant placement next slide sir and the implant has been placed we've placed a stormen sl active 4.1 uh, into 14 mm implant you can see that the implant has completely covered the mesial socket uh, the the distal palatal and the apex uh, the next slide sir so this is well appreciated here so the implant would eventually go and engage onto the mesial side the buccal side uh, sorry the uh, distal side palatal side and the apex leaving the buccal intact so you can also see that we able to achieve more than 2 mm of jumping space next slide sir and uh, what we've done is we packed the jumping space with xenograft so it's it's a long uh, it's a slow resorbing material so uh, the uh, the graft is placed and then we uh, what we've done for this patient is we've done a customized healing abutment next slide sir for good soft tissue molding so we've customized the healing abutment next slide sir and placed it and sutured it so what this does is uh, it it avoids uh, the need for uh, we, we decided not to uh, go for a, a immediate professionalization so because of that we had to achieve closure so uh, one of uh, so instead of advancing the flap we uh, we customize the uh, uh, a temporary uh, healing cap and then we've delivered next slide and you can see the good soft tissue molding that you've got so this will definitely give you a good aesthetic result when you give your final processes great uh, thank you i'll just go back quickly to that one um, yes now uh, dr collins now how much is like the immediate implants in that part of the world which is much much more performed or do they go in for more of than they go for a conventional placement after conventional healing socket preservation that's the type of thing? i i will have to say that my i do very limited implant work because the two colleagues my two associates both do a lot of it and in the past i've done been more involved with orthopedic surgery and trauma so my experience of implant work is very limited now that i'm at the end of my career i'm not going to learn any more new tricks and <laughs> but what's the what's the normally what's the thought process like i mean would the patients prefer an immediate placement or they are oh, okay with the idea of waiting it out Oh, yes, yes. I think immediate implants are very popular um, and uh, they cer certainly do a lot of them. Uh, there's certainly a lot of implant work done. Great. Uh, Chalaji, like when something like Abhinav has spoken and then he's talked about that bridging that gap, like the, we have the jumping distance. Now, what is your choice of bone graft material? I mean, there are choices, like how do you choose it? I mean, of course, Abhinav has given some criteria. But in your plans, in your practice, like how do you do that? So if at all, uh, we have done few cases in my previous college. So if at all the distance is up to 1.5 mm, I don't think there is any need to fill that gap. It will cover itself. Otherwise, you can use the variety of hydroxyapatite crystals with or without PRF. Um, or you can just fill the PRF membrane. So right. basically, uh, PRF also is having good osteoconductive properties. And we have seen in both the cases, uh, if the distance is up to 1.5 mm, if we are not giving any graft material also, the results are equally good. Super. Uh, Abhinav, I'm going to put yes, a question sir. directly to you itself. Now, in this, because I saw a question in Q&A, there are yes, two sir. parts of the question. They talk about the primary stability. Are you expecting mm. it mainly from the apical engagement or is it from the other three walls also? It's from... Uh, and number okay, two sir. question is, in this case, you went in for a customized healing abutment. Why not a, like an immediate provisional restoration? 
Now, this is an anterior zone. It's an aesthetic zone. You are going for almost like everything. Why can't that be converted into a provisional uh, a temporary a temporization? Wouldn't that give have given a little bit more aesthetic sense to the patient also? Uh, that's my question. Right. So as to the first part of the question, uh, we would like to have the stability from all the available walls except the buccal wall. So uh, in, in this uh, case, we were able to completely fill the socket walls and get engagement. But in most of the cases, uh, as long as the drill is along the palatal wall of the socket, we will be able to get good engagement from, from all the four walls except the buckle. But in case, if uh, during the drilling, we tend to, you know, instead of going on the palatal, we, we come a little bit buckle, then we lose the stability of your palatal wall. So what happens, the implant, instead of, uh, you know, if it's, uh, how do I put it? See, if, if it has to be in contact with the palatal wall like this, but the implant becomes like this. So we lose the contact. We will get the stability, but the, uh, you, you can uh, go to the uh, slide with the implant, sir. With the implant, yeah. Yes, sir. Uh, uh, the one where we place the implant, um, the occlusal view. Sorry. All right, no problems. Uh, yes, sir. For instance, now, now this implant has been placed on the palatal wall and uh, we were able to uh, get a good stability. Now, if, if the drilling goes a little bit buckle, meaning uh, usually what happens when you drill, the drill gets guided along the socket, but we do not want to engage the socket. We want to engage the palatal or the lingual wall. If it gets, uh, if it engages the, if it, gets guided by the socket, what happens? The drill goes into the apex and comes out through the buckle. So we always make sure that you drill only into the palatal wall so that it goes and engages the bone above the apex. Uh, sometimes when you're drilling, there is a tendency for the surgeons to get their handpiece a little bit towards the buckle. When that happens, you lose the contact of the bone uh, and the implant. Because as we all know, bone implant contact is very important in achieving primary stability and in the long-term prognosis. So, uh, so it is always imperative that we stay as close to the palatal. Uh, the, uh, we can, uh, and there is another important point that I failed to mention, always underdrill your osteotomies. So if always underdrill your osteotomies because the, uh, the implants that we use are all tapered implants. And the reason for going for the entire sequence of the drill is that we prepare the crestal portion. But here, the crestal portion does not need to be expanded because it's an open socket. And all we need to do is just prepare the uh, epical region and the walls. And that will be done in your uh, uh, undersized uh, uh, drill bit itself. So it is always better to under prepare and place. Suppose you want to uh, place a 4.1 implant you can drill for a 3.3 and then place the implant because of the taper, you will get good primary stability and your chances of the implant success is uh, verified. Yeah, great. And about the uh, provisionalization now? Uh, yes, sir. so uh, uh, for this case, uh, we felt uh, we'll, uh, uh, we'll give the uh, healing. Uh, uh, actually, the main plan was to uh, not load immediately because we had a slight doubt whether we were able to, uh, we would be able to extract without fracture of the buccal plate uh, because it was a root canal treated tooth. Because as you all know, it's, they, they chip away easily as you try to extract them. So we, were, uh, so we thought we'll uh, go ahead and we, we went into the, we went with an idea that we will uh, see uh, the socket and then decide how it is. Fair so enough. we so we thought we will mold the gingiva and then go. This patient was loaded after one month, so okay. after the complete uh, socket molding was uh, the soft tissue molding was done, we uh, loaded this patient with a temporary restoration of occlusion. Okay, it's a delayed uh, loading. That's not yes, it's sir. not the conventional loading as well. Yes, okay. yes, sir. Uh, some of this are like when. Uh, uh, but I'm sorry, let me, let's go on to the bit quickly. Another five minutes, we have got a few cases we'll quickly discuss. And then depending upon time permits, I think we will have to close up. So when we have uh, somebody who is coming in with repeated swellings and our occlusal showing that way, 
what will be your sync to your uh, uh, training? Like what other steps they have to take before jumping into any conclusion about how to manage this patient? Uh, what was the patient complaint? Uh, repeated swellings on the left side, sir. In the okay, okay. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, the one thing which uh, comes to your mind will be uh, obstruction of the salivary gland. Uh, there will be swelling, uh, uh, what you call when you think about the food or eat, that's sort of a typical history. And uh, you can maybe you can, uh, in the x ray, you can be a calcification and a stone, and you locate where exactly is there, and then accordingly you can plan. And now you have other uh, investigation things also, uh, like ultra ultrasound and things like that. And but occlusal view will nicely catch up a calcified mass. And only the, the posterior most aspect, uh, uh, you may not get it. Beyond uh, the posterior aspect of the gland stone, you may not get it in this. Maybe other investigations will give you a picture of that. And then uh, typically it will be a salivary gland obstruction when there is a swelling and uh, roll out other things also, whether any, any other uh, lesions are there, uh, if there is a permanent swelling which is increasing in size and things like that. But typically a recurrent swelling, uh, will be a, a, a clear thing and you can uh, feel it with your bimanual palpation you get that uh, uh, feeling of the stone there and you know then accordingly plan and go whether to go intraorally and just put a nick and take it out or whatever way yeah in this one it looks pretty much in the duct it's very much looks like it it's in the duct so we might be able to extract the stone but if it yeah. goes behind it's closer to the hilum may not be possible uh, uh shaluji your input please Yes, sir. Uh, I would love to discuss one more case where we were not able to find this radio opacity, where the patient was having mm. actually radio lucent stone. So when we have oh. sent the patients for a CRLography at that time, maybe due to that pressure, it was flushed out and the patient was immediately relieved. So mm. it may not happen that every time you find the radio opacity, I want to find that thing. Mm. Sometimes it is a radio lucent stone, which is rare, but it is, it there. is very rare. It is at least very rare in the yeah, submarine. Rare, but it was there because I have come across one patient who was repeatedly saying and giving all the signs and symptoms of sarolithiasis, but in repeated x-rays, we thought our x-ray machine is not okay. We were not able to see. So at the end of yeah. the day, we have sent it for CLography. But uh, later on, he turned up by saying, I'm okay. I'm not having anything right now after the CLography. So we imagine that the stone might be radiolucent and might have been flushed uh, during that. Procedure. Yeah, but I would like to add a point there, uh, Saravanan. Like, uh, again, as she was telling, maybe a stimulation of saliva by a lime or something like that also expel out the smaller stones. Another thing is, uh, I have, uh, we are not used there. I don't know any experience uh, for Dr. Collins also, where there is the, uh, 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 what do you call, uh, like a, a renal stone, you can break it with a, uh, an ultrasound device to which breaks uh, this kind of uh, salivary stones. I would read a British article where a lot of cases are managed like that in a non-invasive way of uh, breaking the stones and you know expelling it out, just like the renal stones are not. The frequency there is a difference. I don't know her experience on that. Uh, are they using any devices like that? We haven't. I haven't been able to use that here. Um, my only other thoughts are that sometimes you've got more than one stone in the duct or in the hilum or the gland, so that it's worth being very careful of the examination of the rest of your submandibular gland and perhaps doing a CT scan to ensure that you, you that if you take out this stone in the floor of the mouth, that there's no other stone further down in the duct that's actually blocking the gland and causing the symptoms. So you've got to think of uh, you know the pathology of the whole gland when you're looking at these patients. Uh, but Samajanji, there are some questions which have been specifically asked for uh, this group. Like we talk about this uh, multidrug, like multidrug combination, particularly when we talk about infections here, pericarditis, we have done a minor oral surgical procedure and those type of ones, or for that matter, even if we are attempting a bone graft, how do you choose your drugs and what should be the regime? I mean, there are people nowadays like using antibiotic for just like, I mean, if you can talk about a single dose preoperative in a pure, like what you say, a clean case, that's a different one. Most of our procedures at the most are clean contaminated, right inside the oral cavity. What is going to be the antibiotic regime? And it's, should that be a minimum period when we have to prescribe the antibiotic to prevent a sort of like what you say, and either the antibiotic abuse so that like we just develop drug resistance of everything. What would be your take on it, sir? You are uh, asking this question to Dr. Colin or to me? I... So both, both of you. I've started with uh, Samitran, sir. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'll tell you. 
So in the case of pericoronitis, as you are mentioning, uh, the first and foremost thing will be not to combine antibiotic unnecessarily. Okay, so you have to stick with your uh, uh, time-tested antibiotic, which is very effective. But you see that you do the incision and drainage or drain out the abscess in a pericoronal abscess, especially in an acute case. You drain it out nicely. Uh, you People use hydrogen peroxide mouthwashes. That nascent oxygen release will be very good in uh, pericoronitis things. Such measures and uh, just plain antibiotic. Usually what we give is a, is a broad spectrum amoxicillin or something like that. That'll be enough, but uh, people add metrogel also there because of the anaerobic organism present. Uh, otherwise, you always better not to combine antibiotics unnecessarily and uh, produce resistance. And uh, textbooks also, as you said, the clean cases, uh, you don't need antibiotic only for infections, uh, provided you do in a very clean area. But our cases, we take a bail and do a precautionary antibiotic in most of the cases. Uh, we may think that uh, there is some failure in our asepsis. We don't want the patient get into trouble. And I have seen people writing too many antibiotics uh, uh, with the fear of that in mind, you know. So uh, I prefer a basic, simple antibiotic will be enough. Sir, amoxicillin is great, but the only problem with amoxicillin when we when there are there are people who would like to write 250 milligram three times a day, but the same when it becomes 500 milligram, they bring it down to twice a day. I mean. The, yeah. your, the duration has to be to do with the half life rather than the dose. And obviously, yeah. that should be the patient's weight, right? But anything, if you talk about an ideal dosage for an amoxicillin, it still needs to be tedious, isn't it? Yes, correct. Uh, because, I mean, that's a very common misconception that when you increase the dose, you can reduce the, the like, what is it? Exactly, exactly. And prophylactic means you can always go with the 250 milligram. That's enough, I think. Yeah. Shaluji? So as per Cochrane Library, you need don't need any prophylactic antibiotics. Even when I was posted in Tata, I have seen those people are doing the major surgeries with just one free of single dose of two gram. And after that, such a, if I will think about that uh, CA patient, they were not given, they are not in a habit of giving the post-operative for three days, five days, the seven days IVs, which we are in a habit of giving. So if your surgery is neat and clean, as per uh, Samitran said, has already described asepsis and sterilization, I don't think there is any need to prescribe antibiotics. Yes, but the, if the tooth is symptomatic, the patient is having pain, the patient is having pericornitis, the patient is having space infection, then you can modulate depending upon the condition. Otherwise, penicillin is still drug of choice. And as you said, we should be worried about the half-life of the drug as compared to what exactly the dose we are giving it to the patient. Sir, so I'm trying to quickly show another one more case of this partial extraction therapy so that like uh, uh, there have been a lot of uh, Q A's which is coming uh, Dr. Abhinav I think I would uh, I'm skipping yes, this one because this is pretty similar to the other one what yeah we, to the previous uh, yes uh, uh, two teeth extraction and then you have done the uh, uh, like implant this, placement and has been primary closure placed it but uh, made it into a two stage like you have closed yes, it with membranes mm -hmm. and other stuff I'm going in for uh, the other one. Uh, I'll have yes, to come back to ankyloglossia a little later. Uh, ankyloglossia and this one, I will probably have to show it. Uh, I'm just trying to show this patient. Yes. Sir. Would you like to tell about this case? Sir? Yes, yes. Sir. So uh, we had a 21-year-old male patient who came with a complaint of, again, a fractured 1, 1, and 2, 1 due to trauma. Next, sir. So a CBCD was done. And uh, on the cross-sections, next slide, sir. We saw that the buccal bone is, was very thin. But so uh, considering his age, we thought we will go in for a partial extraction therapy. So what we did was we elevated the flap, went through the teeth to create uh, the entry points. And next slide, sir. We removed the palatal portion. So what you see on screen are the two buccal shields. The shields were further thinned out a little bit to a 2 to 3 mm width and were kept a, a one or two mm below the buccal uh, plate. Uh, next slide, sir. So this is the buccal bone and that's- Yes, the, uh, that's the tooth. Oh, that's the tooth that's, shield. Okay. And then we uh, went went for the drilling of the, uh, for the final uh, implant placements. And uh, we went beyond the apex. You can see that easily over here. You can see that the PID is beyond the apex. The drill is beyond the apex on the RVG. Right, so next slide, sir. So we, we placed healing abutments and we sutured. Great, great, great. Because yes. there has been a lot of question and answers on chocolate shielding and others. Yes, sir. Uh, so some things, sir, please uh, feel free to like, uh, could you uh, put any clarification on this, sir? Would you? 
So, uh, uh, one more before the, can, can you uh, go to the next slide, sir? So, um, yes. So uh, this is the buccal architecture that we got after the healing phase and after the temporization. So you can notice how beautifully the buccal hard and soft tissue contours have come. So this is the advantage of going ahead with a socket shield technique. Uh, this one, could you would you normally do it in patients who have come in with trauma or would you also consider doing it in a root canal treated tooth which are potentially infected those type of ones? No, so, uh, ideally uh, vital tooth which have fractured due to trauma are more uh, uh, are much more better than endodontically treated teeth or teeth with infections because they, they tend to have a lot of uh, discrepancies. They have a lot of infection you know, at the site and uh, the endo treatment itself weakens the tooth structure. So it is uh, better to plan for a complete immediate placement or for socket graft in those cases. Uh, ideal cases would be uh, teeth fractured due to trauma would be more likely to, uh, to, to go for socket shield therapies. So mainly when you are looking at the buccal bone being... Yes, a buccal bone. Yes, sir. If they are thin. But do a socket shield. Yes, sir. Sure. Because extraction would have definitely removed the buccal bone from there. And, and we would have ended up with a four wall defect. It's forever. Yes, yes, sir. Uh, but, uh, but like how much is the literature support here? Like, I mean, how long the, the best studies, like how long they have been followed up? Uh, three years, sir. At the moment, three and, years. Yes, sir. And they've got the only uh, complication that they've seen is passive eruption of the of the shield. Oh, right. Okay. So, passive, so, uh, passive eruption of the shield. Migrates through. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So the root piece comes out. So that's one of the potential complications. Now, what happens to that buccal contact, like whatever that the remnant of the root? See, when we talk mm. about the bone, we get an osseointegration. When yes, you're talking about a part of the root which is kept there and the yes, implant sir. is contacting that, what happens to that surface? The implant does not contact the tooth, sir. There is a gap between so the shield. Graph that area. Yes, sir, we graph the area. And ultimately, what happens? The tooth becomes like a, uh, like an, uh, like a root stump inside the bone. And the bone thinks that the tooth is still inside. And we're basically uh, uh, mimicking the, uh, as in we are trying to uh, uh, make the body think that the tooth is completely still in there. And so that the resorption does not occur. Uh, Yoga Ji, are you back? No, Dr. Saranen, he, he had a call from the casualty. Oh, so right, he okay. left, so he apologized and he had to leave yes. early. Sure, yeah. Ji. Uh, Jim Sinji, like I think we have a couple of more cases, but I think we are running out of time. It's uh, your call. I mean, uh, like the only thing which I thought was we'll have a quick two calls about this uh, uh, ankyloglossia and this uh, label free. Number. Yeah, yeah, please. Yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, Samantha, sir, like uh, ankyloglossia, I'll just go back to that uh, slide. What will be your advice on uh, how to go ahead with that, sir? When would you do that? How would you prefer suggest the trainees okay, okay. do that? Uh, yeah, is a picture there? Yeah. I'm just bringing it, sir. Sorry, I have to just go back a couple of slides. Sir. Okay, yeah, yeah. Yeah, of course, uh, when you get a case like this, the thing is that uh, you have to just release the frenum, just like in any other high frenal attachment. But uh, the caution has to be taken uh, not to damage the duct opening orifices on the sides. And uh, a laser will be a good option to cut here, I think, with good diamostasis and uh, without damaging the other important structures. Selectively, it cuts through that uh, will be a good option. I don't have a first-hand uh, experience on cutting uh, frenum with the lasers. And I would like to have a comment on that uh, either by Shalu or uh, Madam, uh, how they cut. Uh, they prefer to have a, a knife or a, or, a, or a laser here to release a freedom. Great, sir. Uh, uh, Dr. Collins, if I can ask you this. When this ankle glossia is noticed, obviously it has been noticed by the pediatricians at a very young age. What will be the ideal time to perform the surgery? Because obviously the tongue is not protruding, which means like the, the pronunciation of words, it's going to become very different for this child. So yeah. when it's would you- pediatric, If the pediatric um, doctor sees it, I think they're released very, very soon after birth. And that would be no normally done 
in the first few months of life. It's not often you see someone as old as this with uh, um, uh, you know, such significant ankylosis. Um, but I mean, if, if you would just, I would, I would normally do that. I, would, I think the other thing is that's important is that it's an area which can bleed quite significantly. Um, so you do need to be very cautious when you do it um, and uh, be prepared. Uh, and as you said, you don't want to damage the ducts, but you also want to ensure that you've got complete release and that the tongue will actually move fully. Um, and I, I would normally do that for them under a short general anesthetic. So that if there's any complication of bleeding or anything else, then I would be sure that they would control it um, appropriately. And I would usually do it with a, um, with a knife and a finger. Knife, knife, you prefer a knife over the yeah. laser. Yeah. Right, Shaluji? Yes, sir. first of all, I will uh, put uh, one more comment in this, that whenever there is an anti you must uh, be again to the thorough examination because again, it is found to be connected with two syndromes. So you need to find it out whether it is related to cleft lip and palate or some another thing is there and the patient is just like having ankyloglossia. Then definitely even I'm not having that exposure with the laser lasers pertaining to this ankyloglossia. I'm using a, either a blade or a cautery for same taking care obviously regarding the opening of the duct. Yeah, even yeah. not only while cutting, while suturing also. Many I have seen the PGs while suturing, they don't undermine and they uh, unintentionally, they just uh, suture it along with that and they do the uh, closing of that duct. So that uh, if uh, any postgraduates are attending, they must uh, take that thing into consideration that not only cutting while suturing also, you have to take care about the opening. Fact, on the ventral aspect, you have the, uh, like what you say, the lingual veins are so superficial. It's so easy yes, to catch it. Leading to the Yeah. Right, sir. Sir, a quick word on this uh, particular, this thing, sir, which is, uh, sorry, the next one, uh, which is our uh, hyphenal attachments. I mean, is it for me? Uh, for or... uh, high labial phrenal attachments. When would you release it? And uh, is there anything else, like particularly when it is associated with a huge diastema? I mean, would you go right up to the incisor papilla? Would you have to? do that uh, perecision type of incision, you have to do that or uh, how do you do it, sir? Okay. Yeah. But again, uh, the time for doing that will be as early as possible because uh, before the diastema develops, uh, you can see clinically, it will be better to release uh, very early so that the diastema does not develop. Okay. Otherwise, of course, when patient comes with a diastema and things like that, the first thing you will do is going to release that. And uh, I will take it usually the reattachment you have to be careful about. Once you suture it and uh, leave it, and if you don't go down and a uh, you know, little bit dissect out and uh, release that uh, attachment, otherwise the reattachment is the common thing and the recurrence of the phrenal attachment. So what we used to do is uh, just a triangular cut, uh, holding it with uh, artery forceps and a triangular cut on both sides and releasing and suturing. While suturing, you make sure that it does not allow reattachment of the thing. Okay, and uh, that's the way you handle it. This this V type and, of one. And you should you should ensure that if there's a fiber the fibrous part of it between the teeth is removed as well, particularly where the patient's going on to have orthodontic treatment. They want to be able to move the teeth together, so the fibrous attachment must be must be this, removed. This area, the, isn't it? Yeah. In between the tooth yeah. ones and the neck. I mean, would you use a knife there, or what? Uh, like sometimes would you even use a drill? Uh, I would probably use a knife. Just knife with that yeah. one, and then just between that central area, just go in there. Yeah, perfect. Now, like, is there any and particular then, time? Like, to... would you try to put a tag? Like, would you try to pull it and then see whether it is really coming right up to the incisive papilla? If you have to do that, I think you need or... you need you need to ensure that you've got a nice contour of the lip, and you're not spoiling the contour of the lip. And if you've got a bit of exposed bone or anything, well, use some copac or something similar to protect it yeah. uh, during healing. So maintain the sulcus, and more importantly, yeah, yeah that's yeah. that's great. That's great. Um, yeah, Samantha said, I think we have covered almost everything. I mean, is there anything like which it's a take home, take home, final take home message, like what you would like to give to the young surgeons and the budding, budding trainees? Yeah. So to sum it up, uh, I would say each surgery has its own uh, fundamental principles and uh, follow that. Uh, the basics are very, very important. Understanding the tissues and uh, to dissect, you would have a very good idea about the surgical anatomy. You have to keep on developing your skills and, you know, and all the things you have to take and to make sure that uh, they uh, do not harm the patient by doing the surgery and always avoid iatrogenic 
injuries and plan well and uh, discuss with the patient and tell them the pros and cons, uh, the legal concern taking. Uh, there are various areas so they have to go. And always update with your knowledge and the newer techniques coming up. You have to learn with the laser using piezo systems and plants. And uh, it's a huge uh, gamut of things coming and so fast they are coming. By the time you catch up with one system, another system is coming. So catching up with that uh, is uh, really difficult, but uh, passionately they should follow uh, certain areas and uh, improve their work. With the compassion also. That's uh, my message to them. Thank you, sir. Saluji, you have uh, a final take on point. The sir has covered everything. You need to follow the sterilization is always going to be the base for an oral surgeon, proper anatomy. You should have a thorough knowledge. Read, reread, relearn. Because it is a, at the end of the day, we are also learning. So the students has to understand that it is a... Uh, long journey of learning and you keep on reading updating and one thing um, i have uh, i would like to point out that whatever we are doing in clinics is a uh, we are applying the theory we are applying the literature so you have to keep on updating and even you should know about what exactly has been done so we cannot forget uh, the hard work of the researchers who has given us a history so that that's why we are here with wonderful uh, techniques maybe many more to come Shalaji, i mean in the sense like what you're talking about relearning i just received a message from my brother today morning i mean some quotes i mean i felt, felt one was fantastic he said it is impossible for a man to learn what he thinks he already knows yes sir. right I mean, so I, I really thought like, oh, yeah, that's very nice. I mean, we should all be open at any time to make sure that we have to have the process of unlearning and relearning the right way or, or the more contemporary way. We should be always be willing to, uh, willing to what you say, learn every day. Uh, so the, Dr. Collins, ma'am, uh, your final say, ma'am. I was just going to say, just remember, minor surgery is minor in name only um, and that uh, things can go wrong very quickly so that always be prepared to stop if you realize that you're something's out of your depth and in this day and age when we're looking after patients who are surviving much longer surviving major procedures that are medically very compromised uh, might have undiagnosed disease take multiple medications it makes minor procedures supposedly quite complicated at times and you, you can run into difficulties. So be very thorough in your uh, preoperative assessment and uh, um, decision-making before you embark on your surgery, however minor it may seem. Thank you. Thanks, ma'am. I've been up, there have been a lot of question and answers for your thing for the simple yeah. reason <laughs> yours is probably the most contemporary. Uh, but I'm going yes, to sir. one final question to you now. Yes, sir. Hmm? Or when and where would you actually be comfortable to do a immediate provisionalization for an anterior replacement? So when when we've got a very good stability and if we have achieved the uh, bone contact on all of the four sockets and we are able to give a very good aesthetic outcome at with the provisional, then I will definitely go in for that. Provided so, yeah. we have a good. Uh, buckle plate thickness also because you have all the five walls you have yes, a good sir. buckle plate thickness you have a good primary stability yes and sir. you've got a nice biotype then yes sir you don't mind we going. go in for a, yes sir so never promise that before you start yes only after the only after your implant placement you take the call whether you want to do an immediate loading or not yeah, because that because is anything yes because anything can happen during the surgery you can widen the osteotomy you can lose your stability so never promise the patient to the patient will come back telling you promised me you told me that you will give me an immediate but unfortunately you know, some things are not uh... the tooth in an hour concept and other stuff this is good yeah. <laughs> but but don't go beyond that so i think right, it, because we are not talking about people who just come in and you're not fly by night operators you are mm. going to follow this patient up for life yes These sir patients who are going to be there for life for you mm. right i've just gone through a few of the pictures and other things uh jimson ji you are the final word. Oh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much. It was a very uh, absorbing, engaging discussion. And uh, when you asked me the question whether we can call it off, there have been many messages in the chat box saying, sir, it's very interesting. Please continue. 
So that is the amount of interest this discussion has evoked among the participants. And to see a close to 370 participants for the past, I mean, till the end is, uh, shows that it has been a very great session. And uh, uh, thank you all so much for taking the time off uh, in putting up, uh, putting up a very fantastic presentation. And uh, yes, the presentation actually was little, uh, an extended one, but then I think it was worth it. Uh, with the feedback that we are receiving from the participants. And uh, I promise you that this will be, this presentation will be there in the uh, uh, YouTube channel of our uh, state association, uh, youtube.com slash C slash MaxFax talk. And uh, I'm just posting the feedback link. Uh, you can you can answer, I mean, you can give your feedback in the link uh, to receive your e-certificate. And uh, uh, thank you, Dr. Saronen, for taking your uh, taking pains and putting up this uh, presentation. And thank you, Dr. Ann Collins, uh, for joining uh, all the way from Australia and to Pleasure. having given your inputs. And thank uh, Professor Paul Sandrook uh, for the coordination and for joining us from uh, Adelaide as well. And uh, Dr. Somitran. Uh, Thank you. You have joined uh, being a dean of an institution, of a prestigious institution, taking your time off and putting up the presentation and uh, enlightening the young minds with your experience and uh, knowledge. Thank you, sir, for joining us. And, uh, thank you. Uh, Dr. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Shalu, it again uh, with the uh, uh, evidence based presentation. Uh, I should say that uh, all your uh, uh, talk, whatever you spoke was with evidence, and thank you. That was a great presentation from you and sharing your knowledge among the young minds. Thank you, Dr. Shalu. Thank you so much, sir. And uh, Dr. Abhinav, the youngest among all, and uh, uh, your presentation, your experience, and uh, uh, your uh, 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 cases are amazing. And thank you, sir. Uh, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you, for, thank you so much for the opportunity, sir. And Maurice, more importantly, uh, I have to say your documentation is very good, uh, Dr. Abhinav. I mean, that is uh, that has been our Achilles heel in this part of the world. Uh, KK, sir, yes, what will you uh, what will be yeah. that uh, documentation? Yeah. So, thanks. Uh, thanks once again, uh, uh, Dr. Salman, for uh, moderating this uh, excellent session. Uh, and uh, the, the I think the discussions were very, very good. I can still see there are 358 uh, participants still waiting to you know, hear more. And uh, this is such an excellent topic because uh, unlike uh, the other uh, topics, uh, this covers almost everything in my life. And thank you very much for this uh, excellent uh, presentation and uh, inputs. Uh, so thank you very much. Uh, we are very happy that uh, such programs are happening and a lot of Thank you once again, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir, uh, for joining. And thank you uh, for the help, support as a president you have been offering uh, to our state branch. Uh, and it has been a great honor to work alongside you as a president. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And I'd like to thank uh, all the participants. Uh, we, there are quite a few senior consultants, senior professors, uh, deans of various institutions. Uh, to name Dr. Vivek had joined, there are, uh, Dr. Vivek, uh, Vivekanam Katimani from uh, Andhra, there are quite a few senior people who had joined. Uh, thank you all uh, for joining and uh, not but not the least, uh, Striker. Uh, they have been very supportive for to eight brands for the past two, two and a half years now. Thank you, Striker, uh, and I look forward to your continuous support to our uh, specialty and to our branch. Uh, Chandru, my Chandru, you can. Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you so much for the opportunity. It's so a pleasure to be work and associate with such eminent uh, associations. Sir. So we are greatly honored. Uh, I'm sure we will be continue our associations for what quite long time and days to come. Sir. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Chandru, for those words. And uh, uh, and the next month we are planning for a hands-on course at. Uh, the Ramachandra University uh, on orbital trauma. Uh, it's a limited attendance program. Uh, I think I've shared those uh, details in the various groups. So uh, 
do join and uh, uh, we are happy in bringing education to your doorstep uh, living room <laughs> living room living yeah. room yeah. Yeah. i would like Thank to you. yeah jimson uh, i would like to thank again uh, dr raja and jimson for putting up such a nice program oh, no. and yeah. saravan for and saravan for so beautifully post, yes. and that chairing man has done an excellent job dr saravan and uh, with a blend of youth and uh, overseas faculty is very good and uh, excellent thank you very much thanks a lot sir thank you so much thank you so much thank you thank you abinav